uh, introduction or beginners, you have to consider uh, how far you want them to get or how, how um, you know, what level of depth you want to cover in any particular topic. And so um, this talk is going to range from uh, easy to medium. And there will be parts of it that, that might be a little bit more challenging to wrap your head around. That's okay. Forgive yourself. Like we are giving a lot, you're going to have a lot of different problems in the workshops. Just try to get a couple of them done. Um, and most of these will be solvable by hand or just with a, a website that we're actually going to be giving you. And try to get a good understanding of some fundamental concepts in security. I want you to walk out of here today feeling like you actually have this like flash of insight that you did not understand um, some key concepts of cryptography, these things that you do every day, but you don't even realize it. the machine that you're working on right now, this video that you're streaming, the data that's coming at you. This is all um, uh, pretty bananas, really, uh, how it's actually out working. And, and hopefully we'll give you some insight into how that works. Uh, and also, I want to give a note that the, the main tool that we're going to be working with today uh, was released by GCHQ, which is um, the government communications headquarters, which is the equivalent of the uh, British NSA, if you will, the National Security Agency. Uh, so it is an extremely powerful tool that they released, and it's, it's considered to be this like a cyber Swiss army knife. And it really uh, is quite powerful, and it's going to be what we're going to be using primarily in the workshops today. Okay, that's enough. That's enough setup. I think let's get let's get right into it. So we're talking about cryptography today, and I love talking about cryptography because it is literally the basis of security. When we think about the internet and this 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 forum that we are, you know, we're we're online and we're talking and we're we're talking to a website or we're using a website or we're sending an email. You might not realize it, but it's like everybody in the world is at one giant party. And our goal is to make sure that not everyone at the party knows exactly what we're saying, right? It would be really bad if you sent your password or screamed your password out at a party. You wouldn't do that because people would be able to hear it all around you, right? So when we talk about cryptography, right, we're talking about a practice and study of techniques for secure communication. And often we're talking about that secure communication in the presence of third parties, also known as adverse, um, adversaries. So with adversaries, we want to make sure that these people who are malicious out there can't get our information. I'll refer to them as the bad guys from time to time. So our first topic that we're talking about today is data. I think it's important to note that data is the basis of everything when it comes to computers, not just when it comes to cyber, but when it comes to computers and how data is represented by computers, how is data stolen from computers, how is data organized from computers or communicated between computers. So your first mission today is encoding. This is what we're going to be talking about now, right? What exactly is data? So we're going to cover data and encoding, we're going to cover encryption, and then we're going to go straight into hashing. So my first thought and my first thing that I want to show you is a picture that is going to seem like it's not related to cryptography, but it definitely is important. Take a second to look at this. Anyone have any thoughts on what this is? This right here is an early picture of the telegraph machine, the telegraph machine of communication in the 1800s. So before the days of uh, telephones and cell phones, and uh, you know, I'm not that old, I wasn't around then. So I'm just, I'm just, I read some articles on this, right? And saw some videos, but this is true. Um, the telegraph was an interesting piece of technology. And it was interesting because it allowed long distance communication for pretty much the first time uh, at, a, at an almost instantaneous pace. But there were some problems with this long distance communication. It provided a medium of how we were allowed to talk. See, we weren't allowed to use words or talk over the phone. We were allowed to do one thing, beep. That's it. We could make a beeping sound. Yeah, how sad is that? That's what our technology allowed us to do, make a beeping sound. But somehow with this beeping sound, we wanted to be able to communicate, not just uh, you know beeps, because what the heck would be the point of that, but entire sentences or words or phrases, right? So there was an entire language built around this known as Morse code, right? Morse code basically said, hey, wait, what if we do this? What if we just take beeping, this beeping idea, beep, 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 beep. and we basically say that, we will have, we can beep for like a second or we can beep for like three seconds. We'll call those shorts and we'll call those longs. And with enough combinations of beeping for one second, beeping for three seconds or not beeping for three seconds at all, we can produce enough 
its combinations to create enough characters to represent the entire English alphabet. So this is the rules. We're going to say that short beeps last one second or one time unit. A dash or a long last three time units. Every time we have a letter or a new letter, we're just going to wait one second or one time unit between each one. The space between every uh, letter, I'm sorry, the space between every letter is going to be um, uh, three time units. And then uh, the space between words is seven time units. So using all of these rules, we can start to, you know, press really quick. We can go beep, 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 pause, 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 beep, beep, right? And what does that spell? All of you know Morse code, I'm sure, right? You all know Morse code. You're all experts in Morse code. I'm sure we all use this on our day-to-day -day basis. Here's a chart. Does that help? Of course not. The idea here is that we took beeps. We took the system of literally just being able to beep at each other, right? That's it. And what did we do? We were able to represent these beeps, right, into something that actually makes sense. So what am I trying to say? Hi, welcome to this boot camp, okay? Welcome to this workshop. And uh, this is one example of encoding, right? Encoding here is simply us trying to represent the English language, right, via some other medium. The medium we had here was beeping, and we were able to do this. Another good example of this is consider um, a, an example for the visually impaired, right? This is Braille, right? With enough dots, right, with enough of these little dots, we can organize a, a, a pattern where we can represent letters, right, so that somebody who is unable to see or unable to see well, right, can actually just feel the pattern and be able to, do, you know, come up with the sentences. Effectively, this is a, a physical language, a tangible language, where the medium is, is some kind of texture or surface. In the first example, the medium was beeping, right? This idea of a medium or a representation is, is, is really the idea behind data, behind encoding. And it actually uh, leads me to one final example here, this picture, this guy right here, right? Right. This is this is this is a, a very famous uh, picture, right? Representing the American Revolution, right? Paul Revere over here, and with Paul Revere, he did something, right? One if by land, and two if by sea, and that's a that's a big thought here. One if by land, two if by sea, because with a lantern, with a single lantern, right? Paul Revere was effectively able to say, if I hold up one lantern, the British are coming by land. And if I hold up two lanterns, the British are coming by sea. This is important because with a single lantern, we were able to represent one message, right? And with two lanterns, we were able to represent another message. Yes, right? This idea of being able to hold a lantern and represent some information is actually quite powerful. And it's actually the basis of all computing. Believe it or not, what Paul Revere did is kind of the foundation of, of, of how we send messages in our computers. Our computers are kind of simple. It's like this light bulb over here. This light bulb is quite simple. And when this light bulb, if this light bulb was the only way I could provide a message to you all, I could say that this light bulb can be in two possible states. This light bulb can be off or this light bulb can be on, right? Those are the two things that our light bulb can do. So with a single light bulb, I can actually represent to you two different messages. We can agree as a team, all 50 of us here, right, right now, we can all say, hey, you know what, for the rest of this talk, whenever Corey shows us a light bulb that's off or a light bulb that's on, a light bulb that's off, that's going to mean goodbye to us. And a light bulb that's on, that's going to mean hello to us. Okay, so every time I show you a light bulb that's off, I want you to think of goodbye. And every time that I show you a light bulb that's on, I want you to think of hello. The idea here is that with a single light bulb, I can encode two messages when the light bulb is off or when the light bulb is on. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as zeros and ones or offs and ons, right? The light bulb is off or the light bulb is on. Now, what gets really cool here is your computer isn't made up of a single light bulb. It's made up of a lot more light bulbs. You add more light bulbs, you can get more combinations. In fact, adding a second light bulb not only gets us uh, more combinations, it gets us double the amount of combinations. With two light bulbs, I can still represent goodbye and hello, just like we did in the first example. But now I can start to add other phrases like, how are you? And I'm fine right? More light bulbs equals more combinations. As long as we agree on what the light bulbs mean, therefore the light bulbs mean those things. If from now on we agree that whenever I show you there is a light bulb that is turned off, that means goodbye, then you know that that means goodbye, right? Well, this is the idea behind computers and encoding. When we talk about encoding, we just agree upon what these light bulbs, these switches represent, what these combinations of ons and offs are. These ons and offs can mean goodbye, hello, how are you, and I'm fine, and we can start to have a conversation. But we can also say, you know what, 
This combination of lights, 00, 01, 10, and 11, can actually represent letters like A, B, C, and D, right? Uh, we can say that now we have an alphabet. And with enough letters, of course, we can represent the alphabet. We can also represent numbers this way. We can say, you know what? 00, zero is going to be off, and 01 is going to be on, and 10 is going to be uh, um, 2, sorry, 0, 1, 2, and then both on will be 3. And we can literally start to count like this. This is pretty interesting. With enough lights, with enough ons and off switches, we can actually represent literally anything. And the more light bulbs that we add, the more data that we can have, the more combinations. Notice, adding a third light bulb doubled the amount of combinations we could have. And your computer nowadays is composed of literally billions upon billions of these. Okay, billions of these. So you can imagine just how, many, how much memory you have. This is what a bit is. A bit is a single light bulb, a single light bulb that can be on or off. Well, if you've heard of the term byte before, maybe you've bought a computer, <clears throat> a byte is eight bits. A gigabyte is a million, uh, sorry, a billion of those, a billion of those. So eight billion bits equals one gigabyte. A lot of you are sitting there with gigabytes, like 500 gigabyte hard drives. Just do the math there on how many of these are in your computer, right? These little light bulbs that can be turned on and off. Again, we can represent with enough of these light bulbs, pretty much any combination of anything, all of the numbers or all of the letters. We refer to these series of light bulbs, not as light bulbs when we talk about computer, but like I said, we refer to these as bits, and we call this notation binary, zeros and ones. And this combination of binary is actually the basis of everything else. We call binary the basis of everything else because it allows us to represent things in more, um, um, you know, things that we understand better, right? Uh, for example, like here, I'm showing you 000 represents the number zero, whereas 001 represents the number one. If we want to go to the number two, we need to consider our light switches, right? Our light switches can only be on or they can be off. There is no third state to our light bulb. It can only, I mean, unless you're all fancy and stuff and you have those like dimmable light bulbs. And if, that, if that's your case, then you're just too cool for me. But, uh, you know, most cases, light bulbs have to be off or they have to be on, right? And because of this, this is why I like to think of light bulbs in the case of binary. So when we go from zero, zero, one, and we want to represent the number two, we can't turn our last light bulb up higher. We have to then turn another light bulb on and turn the first one off to represent the next number, right? So this is how binary works. We call the numbers on the left, that combination of 000, zero, zero binary. And on the right, we refer to that as our base 10 system, right? We have 10 fingers usually. So that's, that's why we usually, we, that's, that's why we re represent our, our binary system in decimal or base 10, right? So we can say that 000, zero, zero represents the human number zero. Zero, zero, 0001 represents the human number or decimal number one. Zero, 010 zero represents the decimal number two. But this is so cool because early computers took advantage of this and they said, you know what? What if we just say that zero means A and one means B and two means C and three means D and four means E? And if we keep going, we can actually spell out the alphabet. And this is the idea behind a notation known as ASCII, which happened in early computing as well. This kind of encoding that we're doing, representing data in one state or another, is literally all we can do. Because what we have to do is take our zeros and ones and represent something. Look at this chart over here. We have decimal to ASCII, right? We have decimal values. Look at this. So if you look at the decimal value 65, there's some bits, some amounts of ones and zeros that represent the number 65. That number represents the letter A, capital A. Right? Notice this chart over here that goes through all of these different characters. This right here for a long time was the standard way of your computer representing characters or letters, right? Um, pretty cool stuff. And you can notice here, there's a lot of old fashioned ones like carriage return, right? These come from the typewriter error, right? Where, where you would like click enter and it would like make the carriage return back to the beginning of the line. So a lot of these uh, ASCII symbols or codes or characters for the computer to understand uh, comes from the basis of, 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 of typewriter typing. So pretty cool stuff. Data. 
all of this comes back to data, a bunch of ones and zeros. And representing that ones and zeros is like the basis of everything that you know. And this is going to become very important when we talk about hiding that data later on. Because what's important, the secret here, is that everything at the end of the day is ones and zeros, no matter how you shake it. Whether you're watching a, a TV show or a movie, right? We have some way of taking ones and zeros right, and representing some image, some pixel, something on the screen. So what are our takeaways with encoding? Before I show you the main tool that you're going to be using, as you kind of get your own uh, kind of hand on encoding, encoding is simply the representation of data in any particular medium, right? It doesn't matter whether it's computer related or not. Being able to represent data, thoughts, ideas in any medium at all, that is the idea behind encoding. Now, right now, we use encoding in our discussions to represent data in ways that are very logical, right? Oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. If I have enough light bulbs, I can technically represent any letter. Or yeah, I guess I can say, all right, let's say that this combination of light bulbs equals goodbye, hello, how are you, and I'm fine, right? Because we can encode all of these messages and communicate with each other. But when we talk and move on from here, we're going to talk about hiding these messages. But how can you hide messages if all of it at the end of the day are zeros and ones? Well, this is the basis of cryptography, right? This is actually how we get into the complicated stuff later on because we understand these basic concepts, right? Being able to represent data in one form or another. If there's one thing that you learned from this beginning portion here is that at the end of the day, the computer only has one medium, one way of representing all of the data. And that's just ones and zeros. That's it. There's no other way. Everything else is just ones and zeros. So what's our first challenge for today? I want you to decode a lot of different kinds of data. I want you to try to go and take some Braille and figure out what it is. I want you to take some binary and convert it to uh, English. I want you to take some binary and convert it to numbers. But how the heck are we going to do that, Corey, with only 25 minutes of even hearing anything about this? Well, uh, introducing to you all uh, the the uh, main tool that we're going to be using today, which is CyberChef. Okay, this CyberChef tool that you're all going to be using today is actually quite uh, quite interesting. Let's say, for example, I want to say this is so cool. I can type into this input box, "This is so cool," and if we want to know what this will look like in binary. I can go and type in the word binary for the operation that I want to do and just simply drag this in. And now look, it's going to convert this input to binary. And look at that. Now over here, we have binary. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, I think we have a message that popped up. We will be sending out this link when uh, in, in just a couple of moments. So you'll see that I can do this. I can put in some input and we get some output. The cool thing is you can also go the other direction. Let's say I start and give you this output, right? I can go back over here and I can place this as input. Let me clear out the recipe and I can go from binary. And now we can go back in the other direction. Let's say we want to... Um, go ahead and convert a number from number form, something like 121. And I want to convert that number back to binary notation. I can first say, I want to come from decimal or base 10 and take that and layer it with two binary. So take a number from decimal and output it to binary. And now we have the number 121 actually represented in binary notation. This is pretty cool stuff. And this is what we're going to use today. There are a bunch of different tooling in here for uh, what, what we're going to be working with today. So where are you going to find the, the missions, your first mission for today? Well, we're going to send you a link in just a couple moments. Uh, you're going to go to cyber.fullstackacademy.com slash hacking workshop. Um, and so uh, hacking dash workshop, and you'll see something that looks just like this. It will give you a link to the CyberChef challenges. And 
each of our teaching assistants is going to take a group of you through the first set of challenges today. So you'll work for a couple minutes on a challenge just like this. You'll have to convert Morse code, for example, back into uh, English, and I'll, I'll let you figure out the recipe for, for trying to do that with this, with this tooling. All right, so you'll, you'll drag that Morse code right into here. Um, and, and you'll try to translate from all of these different things. We're working on our encoding and decoding. And that's our first section today. This is the basis for what we're gonna get into the next unit, which is even more fun, which is encryption. All right, so before we get started, um, um, I just wanna make sure that uh, we are ready to go and break into groupings, okay? So we will send out that link. Um, Rachel, can I have you send out that link in the chat? There you go, uh, perfect, um, awesome. And so we'll send out that link and we're going to put you all into breakout rooms now with a fellow. This fellow will be there to, to answer any questions you have or discuss this topic uh, further in detail. Um, so feel free to, to ask them uh, questions about these units and they'll be leading the charge uh, through this, okay? So we'll be doing this for the next uh, 20 or 25 minutes or so. All right, uh, let's get them started into breakout rooms now. So what's gonna happen is I'll create these breakout rooms. You'll get a pop-up on your screen that says you've been assigned a breakout room. You press the button to join it and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, see everyone soon. Okay, I'm gonna begin then. So there's this link over here. You can click it. It'll bring you to CyberChef. Very, very useful tool for decoding stuff. Encoding as Corey went over. And then all you have to do is use it. Just gonna copy that. Paste it into input, find Morse, or double click it. And wow, that is your first answer. Now you can begin to do the rest. So it's a simple matter of finding the recipe on the left, left hand side, you know, whatever you're looking for. Like I looked for Morse, so you can find it there, type it in. You can paste your message in here, as I did, and then you just click bake. Everybody understand how to use CyberChef? All right, good. So let's see if you can get all these problems. All right, so I'm just gonna walk through to 4A then, really, really easy. Um, so you see we have the second one is already, is a one, so that means we have a two. And we have the third one is a one, that means we have a four. So then we simply add the two and the four, and you get six. So how you do the number seven, would be, you know, check check the one over here. It's simple binary math. Check one, check two, and then that's three, four, and that's seven. So I think it's zero, one, one, one. That's all there is to binary math. For whatever there's a one, you take the value of what, depending on what position it's in, add it to all the other ones and their value. That makes sense? All right, so basically where you have a one, depending on its position in the binary, will define its value. So if you have a one all the way on the right here, like this one, you have a one, that gives it a value of one. If your one is over here, that means it has a value of two. If it's in the third place, it has a value of four. If it's in this place, it has a value of eight. So when you have multiple ones, like if I had this all one, one, and one, it would be two, or rather one plus two plus four plus eight. Oops, that's not right. That's right. No, that's still not right. I had it right the first time.
And I'm just, just going to confirm I'm right. Actually, I can do it here. Oh, from binary to decimal. Oops. Another way of looking at binary is like um, 0, 0, 0, 1 equals 2 to the 0th, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 equals 2 to the 1st, 0, 1. Equals 2 to the 2nd, and then 1, 0, 0, 0 equals 2 to the 3rd. And so on and so forth. So like uh, even further down is two to the fourth. And one 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 would be represented two to the four plus two to the third. Hopefully that's more helpful. Did everybody make it through binary? Or, is, or are people still struggling? Good. If you do have a mic, you are allowed to talk, by the way. You don't have to be muted for this portion.
All right, I'm gonna leave the bonus alone, but for ASCII, same thing with this tool. This tool is so good. You just use ASCII or do ASCII? I don't really remember. What was it? It should be ASCII. Yeah, there it is. Enco text, not UTF. Oh, UTF-8, doesn't matter. No, oh, don't want to cooperate. Fine. And just to confirm that my work is correct. Someone do it. Oh, oh I, I saw it. Thank you. I mean, it'll work from decimal, but you're supposed to be able to encode in ASCII. Hold up. Let me see. Nope, I guess it is just decimal. All right, whatever. I guess this one is from ASCII. Let me see. Yeah, it's not a valid by the way. Okay, so then can run that. No. Yikes. Showing me up. Yep, not valid. Right array, that makes sense. Is it this one? So. You can die. Nope. All right, anyways, barring those last for you. Um, or did I have to do that? Is that what I have to do? No, 
that's not gonna work. Yeah. All right, anyways, um, you should all probably click the, um, if I can find the damn button, the leave breakout room button, um, not the leave meeting button, just the leave breakout room button, um, because the next lecture is going to start in about one minute. All right, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get started then, uh, and let me share my screen. And here we go. What's this mean, everybody? That's right. Hello. Welcome back. All right. So hopefully you got something out of those first set of exercises. Um, I think encoding is is um, is really uh, one of these one of these things that once you have it like click that like oh wait with 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 enough ones and zeros you can literally represent anything. It's kind of mind blowing, right? Just if you think about it, like you could just say, all right, we'll just double the every time you add one one more light, you double the amount of things that you can represent. So it's nearly infinite when we add so many bits, right? Um, so so uh, let's get right into our next topic, which is going to be uh, encryption. So uh, let me get started on this. So in encryption, so this is your next mission, everybody. How do we keep data confidential? And that's the question that we're talking about right now. Turns out that this question is quite old. Um, uh, consider a, a situation like back in, I don't know, the, like let's say ancient Egypt, right? Where everyone's having a house party, right? This looks like a picture from ancient Egypt. How do we, how do we, how do we tell just one person at this party a secret, right? Without everybody else overhearing this. Um, this is actually kind of a, a challenging problem when we consider that the party is actually the internet uh, and there are literally billions of us on it. Um, and so it, once you have that click for you, it becomes almost scary that we use this thing every day without considering like, um, uh, you know, how to do this. And by the way, the internet was built without encryption in mind. We built for the ability to like look at websites, like Wiki think of Wikipedia as the only goal for the internet in the early nineties. Like this idea for an encyclopedia where you just kind of like went to a website and like read an article. We didn't have like Facebook and, and Gmail and like all this kind of stuff that's really personalized or dynamic about us. So this need for encryption has really increased over time as we've used the internet. But we should have learned from the past, right? Because the idea of being able to have uh, um, um, secrecy between parties has been there for a long time. And here's the idea with encryption. We take some message. We're gonna refer to that message as plain text. And with this plain text, we're gonna combine it with math and we're gonna create what's called the cipher text. That cipher text is the result of plain text plus math. Make sense? That, that result becomes what's called the ciphertext. And so the ciphertext, the hidden text, should be able to be shouted as loud as you want at that party and nobody should know what it actually means. Good encryption would mean nobody should know what that, that message means. It can be shown to anyone. Think of it like if you were to like put a bunch of like stuff into a safe, like a, like a little safe that's locked to someone's hand, right? Like this is how they like put money into the machines at like the MTA, right? They, they take the money out of the machines and they put it into a safe. Like if, if, if all of that money is locked in the safe and you give the safe to someone else and they're not able to open the safe, they might as well just carry it to your destination. See, you're giving your data to your internet provider every time you talk over the internet, right? Like as soon as you say something, they, you're, pay, you're literally not only giving them your data, you're paying them to take your data from one place to another, right? Like, like you're saying like, hey, can you be the highway for for me that gets the information from my computer to google.com to gmail.com to facebook.com right that that pathway that you're literally asking them to take for you that's that's an internet highway right um and so what we need to do is make sure that what we give them just isn't this plain text. We want to give them this cipher, this thing that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Oh, yeah, we want you to transfer this to the destination, but you're not going to know what it is. It might as well be inside of a safe that they can't see. What's important about encryption is that it's a two-way process. 
Encryption is a two-way process. What does that mean? That means that we should be able to lock up the safe, hand the safe to someone, right? And then they should have another key to unlock the safe, right? At the other end of this channel, right? Who can decrypt it. So there's two things that have to happen. There needs to be somebody who can encrypt and someone who can decrypt. Let's take a phrase that many of you will judge me for. Something like, I like pineapple on pizza. Yeah, I don't want to hear it. I know I do, whatever. You can judge me, but it's cool. Um, so we have some pineapple on pizza and I don't want everyone to hear this at the party that I'm at. So instead, I'm going to use some math to encrypt this thing. I'm going to use a special key. And what that's going to allow me to do is at the party, when I'm talking to my friends, I'm going to say, hey, 1A3E8814D86B. And you're like, okay, please stop talking to me like that, Corey. It's kind of annoying and rude at this party that you're just shouting numbers and letters at me. But what they don't realize is that I'm trying to communicate to someone on the other side of the room who also has the key, who can take my message and realize like, oh, wow, you spent so much work just trying to hide from everyone that you like pizza, pineapple on pizza, Corey. Wow, that's embarrassing, right? So, so this is the idea behind encryption. It's this two-way process, right? That's very important. And we're going to talk about why I keep stressing two-way process later on. Um, this is the main way. Um, so, so there's a couple of big things that we talk about here at the Cyber Bootcamp, and this is addresses the first of them, which is uh, confidentiality. The idea that we want to make sure that our data is only seen by the people who are intended to see that data. And again, this problem has been around for a long time. Let's talk about uh, one way of doing this that almost seems silly, which is called steganography. The idea behind steganography is simply hiding a message in plain sight. In fact, you've been looking at a message this entire time and not even knowing it. And I'm going to prove this to you in just a moment. So um, when we talk about hiding a message in plain sight, basically the plain text acts as a cipher text. So I can say something like, hi, Elaine's looking playful, right? And you're all like, that's a sentence that Corey said, and that's kind of weird for him to bring up. But really what I'm trying to say is help, please. I'm, I'm tired. It's Saturday morning. I want to sleep, right? So, so, so the idea here is that I can hide a message within a larger message. And as long as the person at the other side knows to look for these clues, right, uh, then, then of course they can do this. Okay. So does this idea make sense, right? That we can, we can take a message and then hide it. In this case, the plain text acts as the cipher text, right? Like in this case, uh, the assumption is, is that somebody along the way will not know that I'm trying to do this. It's very, very, very weak cryptography overall, right? Because uh, it's really known as security through obscurity, meaning that I'm trying to hide the fact that I'm ciphering text as opposed to like just ciphering to begin with, right? In my other example where I encrypted, hi, I like pizza, that, that, that sentence was gobbledygook. You have no idea what I was trying to say there, right? But in this case, I'm actually trying to say something and hide the real message inside. Um, believe it or not, this happens a lot with pictures on your computer. And pictures on your computer that you download could actually have malicious information inside of those pictures. There's one process of encoding pictures with malicious information or with uh, hidden information. This is known as the least significant bit process. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about every movie that you watch right now. You ever notice that when you watch a movie or you download a picture, the magnitude of those files are so large compared to everything else that you download? How many of you have noticed this before? Just give me like a head nod. Yeah, like, oh, wow, those are on the order of gigabytes, megabytes, right? You, you see this, right? Well, why does this happen? All right, how many of you have heard of 1080p or full HD? Yeah, okay, let's do some quick math for you. What does 1080p mean? Well, 1080p means that there's 1,080 vertical pixels on a screen, usually by 1,920 horizontal pixels. That's about 2 million total pixels in a screen, 1,920 times 1080. Y'all with me on this math? Two million. Well, for each pixel in the screen, there's three lights behind each pixel. There's a red light, a green light, and a blue light, okay? That red light can be either off or on in different amounts. So you can say that that light, it is like our scaling light in this case, where it can be very little red all the way through maximum red on a scale of zero to 255. That works out to actually be eight bits. So for every amount of red in any pixel, for that light of red in a single pixel, there's eight bits. For that light of green in any single pixel, there's eight bits. And for that amount of blue, there's eight bits. Eight bits, that's three bytes. Okay, so eight bits is one byte, then three pixel, three colors is three bytes. So that's three bytes per pixel of data times two million. That's two million times three. That's six million bytes, right, of data per frame at 1080p, right? That's six megabytes per frame. That's why an average 1080p image is about six megabytes, Okay, but then you got to take that by how many frames are in a second. Well, there's 24 frames usually in a movie per second. So that's 24 times 6 million, right? Then you got to do that times the number of seconds in a movie, right? And you got to do the math there. We're at an astronomical number, right? We're ordering, we're talking about gigabytes, sometimes ordering on tens of gigabytes, depending on how long the movie is. So that's why. But what turns out is that 
the, when you have a sliding scale of how much red or how much green or how much blue in any particular pixel, the difference between level 254 red versus 255 red is very insignificant to the human eye. So insignificant that I can slightly change my background as compared to my coworkers, and you might not even notice a slight change in the color. It's so small that the human eye can't even notice it. This is called least significant bit. Take a look at this small example. I've made a mini screen here with a couple of different colored pixels. We can assume black means zero red, zero green, and zero blue for any particular pixel. Let's take a look. If we zone in on one red pixel, we can take a look at this as combination of red, green, and blue, where the red factor is set to 236, the green factor is set to 93, and the blue factor is set to 87. Look at that. Green and blue are in the 90s, almost at 90, and you can barely even notice they're in this picture. They slightly just alter the color of red that you see on the right to make it this other look. With a combination of red, green, and blue, we can effectively represent every single picture. But take a look at this. I'm not making this up. If I take this image and I move it to the one on the right, how many of you can see the difference here when I barely change the amount of red in this picture? Anyone? Nobody. Nobody at all, right? So what I could do is I can basically say, I'm going to use this encoding scheme where I'm going to alter every pixel in my picture by one bit one bit, and the amount that I'm gonna move it by, when you were to take all of the bits from all of the colors that I've barely shifted, will represent the ASCII or the characters that we just learned about. So that, that ones and zeros combination, the amount that I'm shifting by, is gonna represent actually letters that I'm trying to represent or a message that I'm trying to represent. It's hard to think about it, right? But like, really, if we just shift everything by one bit, then we can actually represent a bunch of data, right, secretly. Right? We can basically have someone on the other end who knows how to decode this. So if I shift something from here to here, I'm trying to give you a message. Does anyone know what this message is? I'm trying to shift it. Can anyone tell? This, this basically, the amount that I'm rotating each pixel by, the first pixel I'm rotating by zero, the next pixel I'm rotating by one, the next pixel I'm rotating by one, then by zero, then by one, then by zero, 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 zero. And you can see I'm just doing this ever so slightly. You can't even notice it. Anyone know what this stands for? Hi. Hi again. Hello. Hey, how's everyone going, right? So I keep doing this thing, right? Where, where, where like I'm showing you some basic text, but that is what that means, that little thing. So if you had the ability to decode this image, you could actually do that. And let me show you really quickly, if we go back to um, CyberChef and I clear this recipe, I'm gonna take my current background um, right here. This is my background, download.png. Uh, that's not right, let me clear this. Uh, download.png. So this is, this is actually the picture. I just want to prove to you all that this is actually the picture. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. This is my background right now, right? So no, no, no tricks up my sleeve, yes? So, um, and when I go ahead and I do this, I can run it through what's called least significant bit, and I can extract that. Uh, now, I don't remember how I, I encoded this, so we got to play around with this a little bit. It might be uh, R, G, and maybe... Let's see, B, so I, I'm hiding information in the reds, the greens, and let's see, am I hiding information in the red and the green? It could, so by the way, this could take a moment, right? Because pictures are very large. So doing this extraction, it can take a minute or two. Um, so let's, let's let this finish. Okay, almost there. Let's see if RGB, let's see if this gets it done. We're baking. Here we go. Let's go. We're almost there, Cyber Chef. You got this. Okay. I can, uh, maybe I'll use a different tool for this. Uh, let's Steg Decoder. All right, yeah, this is fine. So I'm going to decode this image. Let's go ahead and, and actually decode it. Um, let's go to downloads and let's go ahead and go to download.png and open that up. All right, so this is the input picture, the one that we were expecting. Let's actually decode it. See if this will be a little bit faster. Ah, did you think this was here? Look at that. All right, so behind, behind my background this whole time, ooh, you didn't even know, right? I tricked you. 
Ha. Huh. But that's kind of scary when you think about it, right? Like in this case, I hit something behind my image that like you didn't notice and it was like kind of funny or clever. But in reality, it's kind of scary that you could actually think about an image that's like, or a movie even, where like you wouldn't even notice the pixels being this much off, right? And we could hide some malicious information behind them. And this is one thing that you could dive into here at, at, at Bootcamp. We've had students who during their projects dive into this, where they're able to like encode malicious data behind a picture. It's pretty interesting. All right. Well, this idea of being able to hide information in, in other things uh, goes back uh, really early. Uh, one of the earliest examples of this is the, the uh, well, of course, ancient um, uh, Egypt. This was important. But the first example I want to go into with you all was in ancient Greeks. How many of you know what this text here means? Anyone? Okay, good. That's what I expected. I hope you can't read this. This is known as a transposition cipher. What this means is that basically I take this, imagine this like this information on a long piece of tape. What I need is a device that allows me to wrap this tape around it that is exactly the right size and it will actually decode that message for me. This is called a cytale. Um, and this was used again by the ancient Greeks and Romans. Uh, and it was actually quite clever for early cryptography, right? So you would have this text that would seem like gobbledygook, but really what it's trying to do is it's basically saying, hey, this text here is separated uh, by a number of like lines, right? So if you notice like there's the S and then the E and then the N and then the D and all of those are equidistant from each other. So that when this tape is actually wrapped around this cytale, it actually works out. Um, this is in modern times known as a rail cipher, a rail cipher. And the idea is, is that this particular cipher has four rails. So we have S T S F E R, right? What we can do is we can start to see that we have four rails here and we could start to write this out. I can say, okay, let's take our S and then our T and then our S and then our F and then back to the top. And then we have E and then we have uh, R and then we have L and then we have, or sorry, E then R then O then L, right? And we can keep going with this process until finally we get that message that we saw on the previous screen, right? Which was like uh, send, uh, send troops or something like that, right? So send, et cetera. Pretty cool. Right, so this is this is an early form of, of cryptography right here, transpositional ciphers. Um, how well do you think these hold up to computers? What do you all think? Good, these are really good or these are not so good? If I can explain it in, in a, in a three-hour talk, it's not good, guys. It's not good. Computers can crack this, right? So this is a very easy, very easy to crack. One advantage here, by the way, is this works very well across many languages. This, this is alphabet agnostic. In fact, as long as the language is able to be like, kind of like written in a format that can be restructured in this way, it will work. Um, and that's really beneficial. A lot of cryptography is not alphabet agnostic, meaning that like you can only use it with one particular language. And we'll talk about some ciphers that do that. Um, the idea behind transpositional ciphers is that um, a couple of things. One is that uh, you can just try more and more rails. If you know that there is a, this is a rail cipher and you just can't figure out how many rails, you can try writing this out with two rails, then three rails, then four rails, and continue until you have enough rails to actually solve this particular problem. These are also easy to crack because rearranging the characters will result in a solution, right? All of the characters that are in the resultant set are in the character set itself, right? Again, if you look back at that message, that message itself contained all of the letters of the final message. Do you see why that's a problem? Right, like that, that, that makes it very easy that there is a rearrangement that makes sense. That's why these are fairly easy to crack and that's why these didn't last very long. There are a lot of variations though that do better. For example, um, what if instead of going from like this diagonal like downward, right? What if we had a different route that our tape needed to be placed around this thing in? We can create route ciphers. Those are a little bit more complicated or double transposition ciphers, basically doing this twice where you need to wrap it one time. You get some message, some result, write it on a piece of tape and have to wrap it again around a, a different size, side tail. Um, and, and so these are how we can improve this kind of encryption. But overall, transposition ciphers fall kind of weak. The next class of ciphers um, was a little bit more modern, are known as substitution ciphers. So what I want to tell you is this. Okay. Right? You all surprised? Like, what, what, what could that mean? Well, this means this. Hopefully you feel that so far, right? Full stack is so cool, right? So, so, so how the heck does that top sentence mean this? Um, if you stare at it for a couple of minutes, maybe you can figure out what's going on here. Yes? Think about it. Take a second. Well, there's some patterns here that are easier to 
pick out, right? For example, the length of the cipher is certainly the same length as the original text, right? You can see that spacing there, right? Full stack is the same as KZ, QQ, XY, right? And then is and NX and SO and XT. This is a little bit confusing right here. Um, but all of that we're actually doing in this case is we are rotating the characters of the alphabet. We are substituting one character for another. So in this example, we can go from, uh, um, you know, here's our normal alphabet. If I were to rotate every character by one or use a substitution, general substitution cipher by one, right? I can rotate whenever I see an A, I'm going to represent it with a B. Whenever I see a two, a, you know, if I do a, a rotation by two, I can take A and represent it with C instead. So the cipher in this case, the, the key is knowing how much I've rotated this text by. In this case, I've actually rotated the text by five. Uh, and so you can see that if I take um, um, the letter F, right on this chart so you look at the top row you see the letter f it rotates to the letter k sorry the yeah it rotates to the letter k which is why i represent that with a k in the first information uh, this cipher is actually very, very, very famous and is still used uh, kind of in comical comic relief on the internet today to you know try to uh, hide secret messages with each other over the internet it's not used in any kind of practical sense uh, this is known as rot 13 or the rot 13 cipher it actually comes from the original idea behind the Caesar, Caesar cipher used under Julius Caesar. Uh, and uh, basically this was the idea that we would take the alphabet and we would apply some amount of rotation. Um, and generally it's called rot 13 because 13 is the general rotation, meaning that from A you go to N and from B you go to O, meaning that entire 13 character or half the alphabet is the amount that you rotate by. Um, of course, there are only like effectively 13 possible keys making cracking this very, very easy. Overall, substitution ciphers can get quite complicated though. And that is why they scale much better than their transpositional um, uh, friends. They, the more rotations or randomness that you apply, the better this becomes. For example, if I apply a ROT13 and then another ROT13, it becomes, sorry, not ROT13 and ROT13. If I do like a ROT7, rotate by seven, and a ROT13 and then a ROT5, it becomes very difficult to figure out how much I'm rotating by on multiple iterations. That means that they compound very well and using substitution cipher after substitution cipher actually makes things a little bit more complicated one really famous example of this is the Vigineer cipher um, which was actually described first in in um, um, 1553 uh, so uh, what's interesting here is let's take some plain text like attack and some keyword that says lemon what we can do is we can say, okay, so if the, the keyword here is the actual cipher text, is, is the special key that we're going to be using, and the plain text that we're trying to um, uh, encode here is attack. If we apply the word lemon using this Viginier square, as it's called, um, uh, uh, then we can actually determine what the, the results here is. So what we're, we're going to do is we're going to make sure the keyword fits the entire word. So attack is one letter longer than lemon. So I'm just going to add an L to the end of the word lemon so that the keyword represents, again, that's the beginning of, I would just keep repeating lemon if I had more letters, for example. Um, uh, but my keyword is lemon. So now what I can do with this chart is I can use my plain text and my keyword to result in the cipher text. So if you look at this chart on the horizontal axis and we look for the letter A and we go A, which is the first thing, and we combine it with L, the result of that combination is L. Yes? If we take the letter E, Right, and we combine it, I'm sorry, if we take T and we combine it now with E, so we go to T and then E, and you go down this chart, you'll see that the next letter is X, and we can continue onward. So the result of this, the cipher text would be LXFOPV. How many of you think that this, just by a show of uh, uh, hands here, how many of you think that this is a, a, you know, a better cipher than the Caesar cipher? Anyone think this is better than the Caesar cipher? Couple of people saying yes. Some people are like, ah, I'm not sure. Let's see. Much, yes, much better, yes. Oh yeah, not only is it much better, it resisted all attempts to crack it for 300 years. This was uncrackable for nearly 300 years until 1863 when it was a finally cracked cipher. It was very, very, very good. But you can see that adding a little bit of complexity, right? Adding this, this key, of randomness, right? Makes it so much harder to crack. 
right? Do you see that difference there? Just by adding this key that isn't just a number of rotation, but adding a key where, you know, um, a letter can rotate by, by a variable amount, right? Depending on where it is. Like, look at this, the letter T in the first case rotates to E, right? We have two T's in attack. So when we add T and E, we get X, but if we add T and F, we get M. Right? Notice that T is not becoming the same letter each time, whereas with the normal Caesar cipher, it would be. Yes? So pretty cool. We can have the same letter turn out as two different things. So substitution ciphers actually scale very nicely, but they are alphabet specific, right? They require a limited set character set so that you can do these substitutions, right? With transpositional, it doesn't matter how large the character set is. So substitution ciphers are really hard with um, a lot of the, the um, um, uh, you know, like uh, Asian languages, because it's it's very uh, the, the character sets can be large, especially if you consider like uh, the the multiple character sets in in Japanese or or especially with like uh, Mandarin, and it's almost like nine thousand plus characters. Right? It's it's very difficult to have substitution ciphers for a lot of those languages, um, uh, or at least basic ones. Uh, these are quite easy to crack though, right? The basic levels of simple substitutions are, are quite easy to do. It just requires finding the amount of rotation. But the nice part about them is that they are easy to scale. And what we can see is, is that when we add more complexity here, um, it in, when we add more substitutions, it increases the complexity greatly. And that's really cool, right? So we took a, lot of, a look at a lot of things here. We took a look at the Caesar cipher and ROT13. We took a look at uh, the Vigineer cipher, a polyalphabetic substitution we didn't really talk about, but that's another good one too. To, to discuss here. Uh, and I'm going to talk about modern cryptography, you know, after the next, the next workshop. But this idea of being able to hide information, right, by rotation, by, by this has been around for a very, very, very long time. And so what you're going to be doing in this second part of the workshop, okay, is going to be actually using CyberChef to solve a lot of these problems. You're going to be trying LSB. You're going to be trying, um, uh, I think there's the ROT13 here. So you can use the ROT13 cipher where you can provide it the amount that you want to rotate by. And you're going to have to solve a lot of these challenges that we provide you with. Okay. So I hope you're excited. Uh, you know, we're, we're ramping up. I hopefully you're feeling this become more cybery, but by the next lecture, we're going to be talking entirely about computers. So get ready. Okay. Uh, we're going to get to modern cryptography and modern hashing, which what the heck is hashing? So I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get right into the workshop. So on the bottom right, you will be able to uh, uh, join the uh, breakout room. That's on the bottom right. Uh, you should see a button that says join breakout room. You're going to go back into your breakout rooms now and work on the second part of this workshop, which is the encryption part of this workshop. Really excited for you all to dive right in. All right, so click that join breakout room button and get out of here. Go. See you later. Bye. Here's your first question, right? What you do is you take the first letter or first word of every sentence, and you'll see it's also capitalized. So we attack at dawn. Okay. That's it. Now for the second one, that's CyberChef. You do have the option to like upload stuff to CyberChef. So like if I were to grab that example file, I could just do that. And then you see it's right here. And then like the question says, you know, LSB, pause my decimal, and then you'll see it'll automatically bake and do that stuff. Okay. I will let you all get to it. If you have any more questions, let me know. Oh, for number three, by the way. Um, it includes spaces, and you go all the way up to the S for the first line, and you just do it vertically. And then for the second line, you take the other half, and you just put it on the bottom, like so.
Has anybody got number two yet? What do you lost at? Number one and number two. Yeah, because, yeah, so how am I supposed to like, um, I mean. Which one you lost at? Yeah, the, I'm, I'm not going to be able to, I mean, drag the stuff and put them in. You know, like what, how you did it? Oh, okay, two, so uh, for number two? I mean, you know, you drag them and you put them on the uh, something chef. Cyber chef, yeah. What about it? Yeah. So you don't know how to put these options. Do I have, do I have access to it? Because I, it's like. Okay. Yes, you do have access to it. So in this document, all the way at the top, you'll find a link to Cyber Chef. It's right here. Yeah. And you should be able to go to Cyber Chef from there. <clears throat> Has anybody on number two yet? No, nobody's got number two. Oh, what did I do? <clears throat> so for number two, got to drag that file in here. And then you're going to see it says LSB, not the drug. And you extract from LSB, row, row, and RGB. So I have R, right? I'm going to put in B. Nothing yet. I'm going to put in G. And I'm going to make a fool of myself because I dyslexic. There you go. Okay. Now, this real cipher is a little bit different because you have to just go vertical up until S, including spaces like I have. So you're just gonna put them all the way up here. And then on the bottom, you take everything from this end and you put it all the way over here, including spaces. And then you can read it. So did anybody get number three? What's the answer to number three? Anybody? Okay. I don't know. I don't think I have access to that shelf stuff, so I can't even even get the beam. Oh, you mean to the actual sheet? Here. This is that. You need to make a copy of it by clicking file. Come on, get out of my way. Goodbye. File, make a copy from the link I just put in uh, Zoom. You click the make a copy button and it should make a copy in your own drive. And then from there, you can edit it and do everything I'm doing. And then at the top of that same sheet, you'll go ahead and find this link over here. And that should give you access to this.
So has anybody figured out number three yet? All right, then. That's the answer. Once you figure out that you need to put it vertical up to that point and include all the spaces, you just simply plug it. Same with this part, plug it in and you go not space, so space hard space with space just space two space and rails. And there's your answer. That's how you do it manually. The rest are just separate, Chef. I for deco. Well, those students are in the uh, in breakout rooms right now for exercises. Maybe it makes sense for you to join us. I think we're going to be starting another lecture mm. in the next 10 minutes or so. So we'll have you for the next lecture. So for number 3B, our favorite Google Cyber Chef, you find Rail Fence Cypher Decode. And then since it starts at 2, you just leave it at 2. And then you keep pressing up and incrementing the key until you find out, oh, there it is. More rails, more difficult. Now it's the Route 13. OK, um, you should all return to the main session now. All right. Uh, we've made it so far. And now are you all ready like, to talk about how modern systems deal with these problems right uh and that, that's that's what we're going to do right about now so let me share my screen uh and here we are so everybody can see my screen everybody can hear me yes yeah everything's good you're all you're all good okay and let me get this up of course that means welcome back right um so hopefully you see as time went on that uh, cryptography got better, right? Things got better as things went along. But what actually got better was even beneath the cryptography, it was math. See, better math equals better secrecy, right? Um, I am, I am uh, not a mathematician. Uh, I uh, took a couple college classes in calculus, and that's about my background in math. So I can't tell you all of the math behind these, these algorithms. Um, but they are quite impressive. Um, one that I want to bring up with you, a couple are, are some interesting pieces in history. Um, just by a show of hands, how many of you have heard of something called the one-time pad? This is one of my favorites to talk about because the one-time pad is uh, um, the only form of cryptography, the only one, that is actually mathematically proven to be unbreakable. Um, it is literally unbreakable. Um, basically, input is truly combined with a random character, not replaced or substituted. It's an advanced, these are called by the advanced substitution ciphers, meaning they perform some like quite complicated mathematics to create the substitution that occurs. And in fact, it actually gets down into um, um, sort of the, the operation of this combination, which we won't go too much into. But basically, if you combine a character with randomness, and it's truly random, uh, then then the result of that truly random operation uh, basically is irreversible um, or unguessable. Uh, and so basically, the idea here is that these, these conversion pads, which tell you how to map any given character that you're at to whatever particular character, um, requires you to literally by hand perform this combination operation for every single character in your message. But it also has another problem. See, this is technically unbreakable, but I don't know if you've noticed this already. What does each party need in all of these scenarios, right? 
if I want to encrypt, the other party needs to be able to decrypt, right? You see, there's this sort of key that both people need to have. And the issue is, is that as uncrackable as the one-time pad is, it does require both, as most of these, as everything that we've talked about so far, requires both the sender and the receiver to basically have the same copy of this key. So how did we get that key to them in the first place? right? Because that's crackable, right? If I can just intercept when I give you that key over the internet, if you just send me an email and be like, the password is this. Well, if I can intercept that email in the first place, then who cares how good your password is, right? So, so that's kind of the idea here is like, is, is that yes, the algorithm itself is uncrackable, but the transmission of the key is where the faultiness comes in. And that's why uh, this isn't uh, widely used today. Additionally, uh, uh, is the the Jefferson disk. This was pretty cool. This was Thomas Jefferson's invention in the uh, 1700s uh, that basically allowed you to do multi-factor encryption, which is basically substitution and substitution on substitution and substitution. A letter goes in on one side, and all of these disks need to be lined up in the exact setting for both the encryptor and the decryptor. So you can basically have these disks set in a particular way, and if the message reads A, you're able to follow the disk, or message reads Z, you can follow the disk across to okay z actually meant i but you see how many like layers of substitutions there are right you need to have every single disk on this wheel set exactly to the right position so again there's this syncing up that needs to happen between the sender and the receiver the sender and the receiver right where if if you have a different orientation of your disk even the last wheel is not turned properly all of these are like little individual wheels then this encryption doesn't work it falls short because you need to both have the key to decrypt and encrypt make sense Okay. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Enigma machine? This is probably the coolest example of encryption before. Uh, maybe you've all seen uh, that movie with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, all right? Yeah. Um, so the Enigma machine is, uh, the cracking of the Enigma machine is arguably one of the coolest uh, I don't want to say like one of the coolest things in history, but it's arguably up there and especially one of the coolest things in cryptography ever. Um, the Enigma machine basically relied on uh, a bunch of different things. So the first thing that it did was uh, you'll notice this like wheel, the sort of normal looking key bed, right on the, on the, on the left side where you have the Q W E R T, right? Like just like that, like a normal key pen. And what happens is, is these keys are flipped with a normal rot 13 uh, and then they're mapped to each other. So you see those like little wires that are on the bottom left in front of it. You can say, okay, Q will reflect to E and E will reflect to R and R will become, and it can basically seem like pseudo randomness. Um, additionally here, you can see all of these different wheels up top, right? So, so first thing that happens is you push a key and then it uses all of this reflection based off of those wires on the bottom. And then the electricity goes through these three wheels that have like electrical input and electrical output. And this is so cool. So the electrical input, which is, you can see on the top right here, there's just a bunch of letters that basically signify when the letter comes in as A, it rotates to an M, let's say. And again, this is kind of pseudo random. Um, and then it, it goes out from the first disc into the second disc, the one on the left of it, and then finally to the third disc. And then finally, it outcomes a, 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 a particular letter. And that letter is actually the encrypted piece of information. This is actually bananas for a couple of reasons. Um, one, every time you push a letter, you see those disks, they actually automatically rotate mechanically. And so every time you would push a letter, the next letter, even if you pushed A twice, it wouldn't come out as like the same uh, output. So like A might come out as C the first time, and then A might come out as Q the next time, making this very, very, very difficult to crack. This amount of combinations of things that you can do here, the amount of, uh, basically the, the person on the other side would also need to have an Enigma machine, and it would need to be set in the exact same configuration, exactly same configuration. And so that's how you were able to have these messages encrypted and decrypted, so in the public. But what's really cool about the Enigma machine is that there were over 150 quintillion, that number's so large you can't even like, like here's billion, right? Trillion is like a whole different animal than billion. I mean, if you think of a billionaire versus a millionaire, right? That's like way, way, that's a lot. Come on, that's a lot more money, right? Uh, and then you think of like trillion versus billion, quadrillion versus trillion, quintillions off the chart, 150 quintillion combinations. The fact that we cracked this ever was uh, ridiculous. And there's a lot of story behind you know, this. And, and I think it comes back to, um, uh, so they were saying like, happy birthday, Hitler or something. And like everybody had the same message with all of these different machines and they were able to finally crack it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of rumors to the actual end of the story, but 
Um, the Enigma machine is a really cool piece of history. But again, we added more randomness, more complexity. Our key in this case is really complicated, right? Our key is, is definitely more complicated in this case because, uh, um, uh, not happy, but Heil Hitler. Maybe that was maybe that was it. Uh, it was you know. Uh, so so the movie reference was the Imitation Game. Thank you, Veer. Um, so so you know this is a very 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 uh, um, cool uh, device, and and adding more of this randomness added more complexity. In other words, like I said, better math is better secrecy. So how does this work with modern computers? Remember how we talked early on that ones and zeros can represent anything. Well, guess what? They can also represent a key, an encryption key. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate a key of just ones and zeros, one, zero, one, one, one whatever. And these keys can be 128 bits or 128 combinations or 256 bits long. And what we can do is take that random key and do some key and combine it with a particular character. And the result of that results in some kind of encryption. And the key, knowing that key, that combination of ones and zeros is required to be able to decrypt it. Now, 128 ones and zeros or 256 ones and zeros might not seem like it's that hard to guess. Let me tell you something. That number, I have a, uh, maybe, maybe we'll send it out um, after this. I have a very good video on just how 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 hard it is to guess a 256 bit key let me put it to you this way it is it is uh, harder than guessing like the combinations to the enigma machine it is extremely 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 complicated it is two to the 256th power that number is so large you can't even like wrap your head around it right because it's one or zero for every bit 256 of those Anyway, the, this, the standard that we use is something known as the advanced encryption standard, and it's the primary solution for how all data is transferred over the internet. So uh, this idea of generating a key is how you communicate between you and the destination without your internet service provider knowing everything about the communication so that not everybody can see your passwords in clear text. Okay, so we talked about modern cryptography a little bit, but does anyone see the problem with this? I kind of mentioned it before, but what's the problem with this across the internet? Anyone in the chat want to put something in there? What's the issue with this level of cryptography that we're talking about right now? Think about the Enigma machine. Think about the Jefferson disk. You need to share the secret somehow, yes? Right, that's the problem. We need a way of being able to get the secret to the person. You know, at a party, I can maybe tap you on the shoulder and whisper you the secret and, and you can do it later. But on the internet, there's no whispering right? Everybody can, you have to basically assume that everyone can hear this. So this becomes a problem. We call this the first touch problem, meaning how do I exchange something the first time? How do I give you that key in the first place across the internet against a public medium? Um, and so actually, this actually breaks into two different categories of encryption. And I'm not going to talk about this much here, but if you are interested, uh, we do go into this in our full-time course, um, and um, uh, you know, in, a, in our part-time course that we have here at Fullstack, but but this is the idea. There's two different major types of encryption. The first and the one that we've talked about entirely up until this point is known as symmetric encryption, meaning that both parties have a copy of the same key. Consider Bob and Alice. Bob and Alice want to share some information across the internet. Well, Bob can encrypt some information with the key, and assuming that Alice has the same key, can then decrypt that information. Right? This is the idea with the Jefferson wheel, knowing the exact combination, or the Enigma machine, knowing the exact combination. That is the key. Think about this. Um, if I asked you to, don't do this, right? But I, I, you could do it, whatever. But if you wanted to, 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 to you know, deposit some money in my account, my bank account, come on, hook it up, please. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, let's say I wanted you to do that. Um, could you do it? Could you go? Could I give you my, um, my bank account deposit number without you risking you being able to take money out of it? Yeah. Yeah, of course, right? You should be able to give me money without being able to take, obviously, Corey, right? And But I have the ability to take money out, but you have the ability to put stuff in. This is the idea behind asymmetric key cryptography. This is known as where there's one key for locking stuff in, meaning you can give Corey money, and that money goes strictly to Corey. Rachel can't try to take it again because she always does that, right? So like, like you, can't, you can't do that, right? So, so you can put money into my account, and I'm the only one who can take it out. This is the idea behind asymmetric key cryptography, meaning that there are actually two keys that are used uh, to do this encryption. On one side, there is this public key where you can basically uh, use information and encrypt information using my public key, and then I'm the only person who has the secret key to unlock that information. Now, if this sounds 
bananas to you that this could mathematically exist? How many of you are like, how could this work mathematically? Like, right, like this is strange, right? How can one equation put things in one direction and not the other direction? I, I, for those of you, and this is a little bit beyond what I planned on talking about right now, but I want you to just think about this equation. Think about the equation y equals x squared, okay? This is a very simple example. Y equals x squared. If x is two, what is y? If y equals x squared, if x is two, what is y? Someone put it in the chat. Four, very good, Ryan's right, right? If x is two, y is four, two squared is four. Okay, let's try another one. Uh, with y equals x squared, what happens if y is nine? What is x? Y is nine, what is x? A lot of people saying three. Any other thoughts? How about negative three, right? Given x, you can very easily calculate y, but given y, it's not so easy to go back in the other direction, is it? right? Could you imagine an equation where reversing it was even harder than that, right? Given x is two, y is definitely four, but given y is four, x can be two or negative two. In fact, this we can repeat and kind of make this much, much, much harder. Um, and I could teach an entire class on this particular topic. Um, but this is basically the math that goes into this idea of asymmetric encryption. And this is how, by the way, you get that key to the destination. You see, if I want to send a message to Rachel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, Rachel's deposit box. I'm going to put a key, a special shared key in Rachel's Rachel's deposit box and lock it up. And only Rachel has the key to open that box up. And now, voila, we both have the key, right? We both have the future key that we can use for symmetric encryption. So actually, when you're talking over the internet, how many of you have seen that lock symbol on Chrome or on Firefox? When you go to a website, it shows you like lock, that little safe. Well, guess what? That's what that means. That means that they're using asymmetric cryptography to connect you to the endpoint to make sure that your secret is truly safe. Because otherwise, how would you share that key? If that was a little beyond the scope of this, just imagine that... Um, um, you know, th this idea of being able to get the key to the destination is a really hard problem to solve. And we need to be able to solve this with math. Here's another diagram of what this looks like. So uh, you can take a look on the left side here. Uh, we put in some information and we encrypt with someone's public key. We then get some encrypted text and share that across the internet. And then the recipient, like Rachel in this case, has a private key who can then use that private key to unlock the safe or unlock that information, right? And, and be able to actually get that information out of that safe. So H measure key encryption is extremely, extremely powerful. Okay, so that's a little bit about how our machines use encryption. And um, I think it's really interesting to think about this, right? All of this, again, it's, it's all ones and zeros, right? It's all ones and zeros. And so we need to be able to replicate all of this math in the ones and zero stage. Um, and yes, uh, it sounds like blockchain. Yeah, we're going to get right into blockchain in just about 30 seconds because this next topic is exactly the way that blockchain works, the reason why blockchain is literally untamperable, the reason why transactions in, in blockchain are permanent are because of our third mission today, hashing. Okay, Hashing is the third topic that we're going to talk about. With encryption, we solved the problem of confidentiality. I can send things to Rachel now without caring that the rest of you are able to access that data, right? We can do this with asymmetric encryption or even shared encryption, assuming that we both have the same key. With hashing, we have a different problem. What we're trying to solve is I can send information to Rachel, but it's very hard for me to prove that I, Corey, sent that information to Rachel. See, Rachel can see the data that I sent her, but it's very hard for her to know that it actually came from me. Therefore, the integrity of my data is still up for jeopardizing, right? Although confidentiality can be maintained, the integrity could still be tampered with. And that's what we're dealing with now. With hashing, we talk about the integrity of data. How clean is our data? How much can our data be played with? With these ones and zeros, can somebody change this data? And the best way that we have to combat integrity problems is using a method known as hashing. Hashing, just like encryption, is hiding a message using the power of math. The main purpose of hashing, unlike encryption, is instead of dealing with a confidentiality problem or getting information to a destination, it is a way of maintaining integrity between parties. That is, looking at uh, a, a, if I have some data and I send it to Rachel, I should be able to take my data and hash it and get some value, maybe the number seven. And when Rachel goes and hashes the data, she should also get the number seven because the results of these hashes will then prove that the data has not been tampered with. If I were to then say, let's say hash my data and get seven and I sent it to Rachel and she hashes the data and gets six, 
then Rachel might be a little bit concerned that somebody in the middle had listened in and replaced the data that I had actually sent to her, right? But, and, and that is why she is seeing a different number. The important thing is when you see the number seven or the number six, it doesn't really tell you anything about what I actually sent. By the way, let me also point out, hashing and encryption are often used together, but they also cannot be. And I think it's easier to think about just data in the plain or in the clear when we're thinking about hashing. If I send just a message to uh, Rachel in the clear, right, and Rachel receives that message, how does she know that that message actually came from me instead of somebody who's just pretending that it was me? That's the problem that we're trying to solve right now. This has nothing to do with encryption. This has to do with integrity. You see that distinction? We're talking about a different topic here. Hashing is an irreversible process. When I, when, when I calculate from data and I find out that the, the result of that data hashed through whatever function I used was six, and Rachel does the same thing, given the number six, it is impossible to go back to the original data. It is impossible. If the result of um, uh, uh, um, the file that you all are working on, that hacking workshop file, if I took that file and I hashed it and it came back with the number seven, from the number seven, you could never put back together that file. Does that make sense? The purpose here is not to go backward. It is to simply prove that the result of the data has not been changed. This is an irreversible process. And this is the basis of blockchain. This is how blockchain works. Basically, a transaction that occurs on the blockchain, once it occurs, the hash or the result of that transaction, the data from that transaction is then hashed, put through this special thing. And it comes out with the data seven. Then another transaction comes in let's say a new transaction of data, and it gets combined with that number seven and hashed again. The idea here is that if anybody were to try to change a transaction that happened in history, the chain of hashes would come out different from that point on, right? So like if I were to make a transaction, the result of that transaction hashed would be seven, right? Um, and then as soon as Rachel goes ahead and makes a transaction, it would take my number seven plus Rachel's new transaction. The new result would be 13. Right, and then that thirteen, and let's say um, uh, uh, Veer goes in and 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 makes a transaction, and so now that thirteen plus Veer makes a trans Veer's transaction equals you know four hundred thirty seven. If somebody were to say, you know what, Corey didn't actually make that transaction, or Corey didn't actually spend five dollars, right? Corey actually spent a million dollars because I want all of Corey's money. Then what would happen is that that transaction of Corey spending a million versus five dollars would not actually hash to seven which therefore when combined with Rachel's data would have produced a different number, when combined with Veer's data would have produced a different number. You see that? So it's a little bit complicated to think about, but the idea here is that better math equals better integrity. And hashing is one direction, one direction. You can only go forward with hashing. Let's actually talk about some use cases of these idea of hash functions. The algorithm that's used to produce a hash, just like before we talked about it as a cipher, we call the algorithm here a hash function. The first thing that's very important with producing hash functions is that small changes in input should produce drastic changes in output. For example, let's say that um, I spent $5 on my transaction and it hashed to the number seven. If Rachel spends $6 on her transaction, it shouldn't hash to the number seven. It should hash to the number 4,738,344. It should be very, very, very different. Small changes in input should produce drastic changes in output. Here's a good example. This is a real example here. So we have a, a, a block of data on the right side, and we have a block of data on the left side. And all I've done here is take both of these and I've replaced a single character. You see that this is a very long string of characters. Do we agree? Very long. And all I've done is replace one single letter. Instead of an O, I've made it an X. Very small change, okay? I'm gonna run both of these pieces of data through a special hash function. The one I'm gonna choose to use here, maybe you've heard of it, it's called SHA-256. This is the one that's actually used on Bitcoin. Um, uh, so the SHA-256 hash, which is extremely, extremely powerful. What this does is it results in a sequence of ones and zeros that is 256 ones and zeros in length. Don't worry too much about the math. The important part here is take a look at this. When I run two very, very, very similar inputs through the same hash function, look how drastic their differences are here, right? Look at that. Look at how big, like they don't even look similar at all, right? The left one looks nothing like the right one. And this therefore is a very good hash function. Small changes in input produce very drastic changes in output.
Additionally, no two inputs should be known to produce the same output. Um, for a long time, there was a standard in the industry called MD5, which was a big hashing function. In fact, passwords were stored using MD5 in, uh, hashing. Um, this was uh, uh, really good for a long time, except it ran into a problem that there were actually what's called collisions, meaning two inputs re re reduce the same output. For example, if I spend $5 and that results in the number seven, and I spend $5 million and that results in the number seven, how is that helpful? Right. That then, therefore, uh, then we have two pieces of data, two different inputs that can result in the same output. That's not very good. Um, so if ABC and DEF both uh, are put through some bad or poor hash function, and they were to result in the same data, that would actually be very, very, very bad. Because then some input ABC, I could be malicious and replace it with the data DEF. Right. And as far as you were concerned, when you receive it on your end, if you were to, ha if I were to hash ABC, send it to you, and you were to hash DEF you would get the same hash as I have. That's very bad. That's not good. Um, um, when we had, when someone actually tampered with the data, right? Somebody actually changed the data. So only one input should map to one output. That's important with hash functions, okay? And this is the hardest thing that we're going into today. But what's really cool about this is this is how all of your passwords work. This is how all of your passwords work. Check this out. So here's you you know, going to facebook.com, having a good day, thinking everything's all right. Uh, and, um, or I mean, maybe you're more hip, maybe you're on like TikTok or something, whatever. Uh, I don't care. Uh, so, 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 so you're, you're going through whatever social media you are and you sign up for the website. You're going to go get started into that addiction place of social media. And, and you go on that website and you type in your password and you think you're so cool because you replaced your A with an at symbol, but it's so guessable and you'll learn that when you start to hack. But anyway, so you type in your password on that website, right? And then the, 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 the Facebook on the other side, here's your password. And it has to store that password in the database for later. Yes. So that when you log back into Facebook from your phone or from the, or back on another browser or, or you come back to the website, you're able to type your password in again. So one thing you might think about, right, is like the password might just be stored in this giant text file called the database, right? And later you go and you put your password back in and it's also stored in the database just as password. So you type in password, it gets stored in the database. When you sign up, when you log back in, you type in password. And then that that, that guess that you have gets compared to what's in the database, right? It gets compared and he goes, oh, okay, uh, let's see, Corey's trying to log in as Corey. He put in the password password right now and in the database, I have the password password. This checks out, let Corey log into this website. Does that make sense? Like theoretically, even though the, 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 the details of that are, are kind of being glossed over, that's kind of the idea here. The problem is, is that if we have one giant text file with Corey's password and Rachel's password and Saul's password, and uh, I'm trying to see different names here, and Colin's password, right, all these different passwords, um, then if that one password list gets out, then guess what? Everybody's password is just in the clear. And I would bet that most of you use the same password on multiple sites. I don't know, right? So that would be really, really, really bad. So one thing you might be thinking of, back to our original lecture, right, which was encryption, is what if we encrypt the password, right? Well, if we encrypt the password, this would be better, right? Because then if the, that one document gets leaked with all the passwords, you would, you would need to reverse it. Huh, but that's a problem, right? What's the difference with encryption and hashing? It's reversible, right? See, with encryption, you need to reverse the data. So, of course, you can put your password in as password. We can encrypt it, store it in the database, and then it needs to be decryptable to be able to compare it back to the original password when you go to try to log in later. And, of course, if that password list gets leaked and I could reverse that password list, well, then all I need to do is guess the right key. And with enough time and enough power, I might be able to crack that. Or maybe I just find your key. Maybe you left it in a bad place. And then all that password list is useless. You see the problem with storing passwords in a reversible way? The problem is, is if that list gets out in the open, then, and this happens by the way, you will hear about a lot of data leaks. Yeah, they stored passwords in the clear. They should never do that. Encryption is a little better, right? But of course, with encryption, we know it's reversible. But what if, and hear me out, instead we use the different process. What if we used hashing? Check this out. 
So what if we put in our password the first time and that password is run through a hashing algorithm and the hash is stored in the database? Because hashes are irreversible, even if that list gets leaked, you are unable to reverse that list of passwords. Does that make sense? Like you can't actually go from that result back to the original. So it doesn't really matter. Um, additionally, if I put in a password when I follow up and I log in, now when my password gets received by Facebook, instead of it just comparing my password to the password that's stored in the database, it's going to hash my password and compare the hash to the hash. This is why it's very important that the hashes should only be like one input should replace in one output. It would be really bad if you could type in password as your password, or you could type in Ooga Booga as your password and both would log in because they both result in the same hash. That is why it is very important that hash functions produce wildly different outputs for even similar inputs. They should be completely unguessable. This is the basis of password encryption. And by the way, using this, we could think about how to crack passwords as well. See, if I gave you a hash, you could not reverse that hash, but maybe you could guess what caused that hash. Let me show you an example here. So I, um, I've gone ahead and I've actually gone and I've written, um, let me see if I can open this up really quick. Um, um, so I have a hash for you all today, which is going to be right here. And, oh no, okay, it's not letting me do that. Uh, all right, so this is the hash that I have, this thing, 5BA, blah, 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 blah. Okay, this is a hash that I have. This is a hash from an actual password that's stored in an actual database. Congratulations, here it is. Good luck, okay? So with this hash, reversing it would be very difficult. Now, what I'll tell you about this hash is that it uses a hashing algorithm called SHA-1 to generate it. So let's go ahead and CyberChef and actually generate a recipe for SHA-1. I'm gonna go ahead and drop that in here. and. I can't actually reverse this hash. Notice that like before we saw like encrypt with, with rail cipher, decrypt with rail cipher. We saw encode with this and decode with this. With this, there's no decrypt, there's no dehash. There is no such thing. We can only calculate forward, meaning I can never reverse this. But what I can do is I can guess that what, re what resulted in this password. Okay guys, I want you to put in the chat right now what you think one of the most common passwords is uh, on websites. Go ahead, guess what one of the most common passwords is on websites. And let's go ahead and try to calculate this hash. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Password, password, good. A lot of good guesses here. Let's try some of those. So the, the hash that we're looking for is this 5BAA. Everybody remember 5BAA, 5BAA. Don't forget that. So let's start trying some of these passwords. I'm gonna go ahead and try the first one that was in here, which was one, two, three, four. Does this result in 5BAA? No, it doesn't, right? Therefore, this is not our password. But look at this. Now do you see how hackers can do this? If I get the hash, I can just try to crack it, right? Let's keep going. Um, what was another one someone said? Somebody said ABC, one, two, three. That's not right. Let's try password. Does that look right? Ah, 5BAA. The password that we just cracked was password. So this is pretty interesting. Dumping a hash is actually helpful because, or getting a hash, getting access to someone's hashed password could be helpful if I'm able to actually crack that password. And so today you're actually gonna try to crack a couple passwords using this, okay? And I'm gonna give you some hints and stuff and that's what you're gonna work on this afternoon. One more thing I wanna go into before I let you go. So password security is important. Hopefully you've got a piece of that. If, if nothing else, know that hashing is used to store the integrity of the data. And this is really important as well. When I talk about the integrity of the data, how many of you have downloaded like an installer on your machine, maybe even to install Zoom, right? You had to install this like installer to install it for you. Imagine I was really malicious and we're at the same Starbucks and you go and you download, um, obviously not right now, but like in general, we're at the same Starbucks. And so, um, you know, you go to install or download what's called installer.exe. <clears throat> you know, you've heard of files like this, installer.exe, except when you went to download it, what I did was I took your data and I replaced it. See, I, down, I, I named the file installer.exe, but I saw you go to download this on this website and I replaced the data of that file with something malicious because I'm sitting in the same Starbucks and I intercepted your request, that wireless thing that you're doing uh, in the Starbucks. The details of how that happens is beyond the scope of this class, but imagine that did happen. That would be very bad.
if you've ever noticed when you download apps, sometimes they'll say that the SHA-1 hash or the MD5 hash is this thing. And this is what they're talking about. So you can take your file, which is composed of random data for this installation process. And through SHA-1, it will result in a particular hash. Through MD5, it would result in a particular hash. Through SHA-256, all of these are just random things. It will result in a particular hash. And what we can do is we can say that if Corey were to touch that data even a little bit, the hash would not be the same. So oftentimes when you download something on a website, it will tell you that the hash of this should be, um, you know, 1682A. The SHA-1 hash of this data should be 1682A. That means that if you were to take that data and actually hash it, right, it would result in something different. What's really cool with CyberChef is you can actually do this right in CyberChef. I can take a file on my computer. I'll take this cute picture of Kaya that hopefully you all saw. I'm going to take this picture of Kaya, which is just a bunch of ones and zeros. And what I'm going to do is, let me, let me clear this. Okay, I'm going to clear this data, and I'm going to run it through the SHA-1 function. And now the hash of Kaya results in this. Now, this is uh, a picture of Kaya, of course, my, my cute dog, and it's important that you know about her. Um, but here's a, um, uh, a separate file. This is Kaya, the same Kaya, same picture, okay? Same picture, just to prove it to you, except this one is the one with the message that's been hidden behind it. Let's take a look. So if instead I use Kaya message two, notice that that hash is completely different. The two pictures might look the same, but the one that has been tampered with, the hash is different. Again, I'll show you the original. So this one ends in D985 it starts with, and the other one the other one is it's taking a moment. Again, this is a bigger file, so we might want to maybe turn it back on. There you go. Uh D985. Am I uploading the same file? Um let me try this one. This one's been slightly tampered with. It might not be refreshing here, but trust me when I say that this is going to be slightly different hash. Um, so D985. Let me clear this recipe. Okay, so here we go and run through SHA-1. Yeah, there you go, C116C. C. So here you go, another picture of Kaya, uh, uh, C11C. And just to prove to you that this is also a picture of Kaya, I'll. Same pic the same picture of Kaya, by the way. Here you go, download three, download three. Just there, All right? So pretty cool stuff. We can actually use this to do integrity, right? Because now if you download this thing and it says, make sure that the hash says this thing, you can use CyberChef to actually calculate the hash, make sure that file hasn't been tampered with, right? And now you know it's safe to use because the person who intended for you to download it from actually is the person you downloaded it from. So guess what? Today, you're gonna dive right into these missions and you need to identify which files have been tampered with today. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so that's gonna be our last thing. And then we're gonna all get back together in about 15, 20 minutes for a quick Q&A. So with that being said, go ahead and click right back into that uh, join breakout room button and hop into the last workshop that we have here. Cool. I'll see you in a little bit. Okay. Welcome back. Um, so the first one, All right? We can go over this one real quick. Yes. Our favorite cyber chef, you go ahead and hit SHA-1. And then you go ahead and take your whatever it is, Kaya zero, right? So I go Kaya zero. And I'm just gonna do this real quick so I know. Alright, so just gonna just gonna mess it up if I do that. So I need to go for Nope. 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 Nope.
one TCC. Equivalence. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I'm gonna get some water. Catch up. Okay. Equivalence. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes. So, so what are, we, what are we doing now? Because I don't see. You were supposed to go to this part of the thing. Oh, okay. The that thing? just. I'm trying to solve the first one. CC163, and it's like Kaya something. And you just got to keep guessing until you get it. Uh, yeah. Zero. One, two, three, four, four. There you go. I have four, and that's how you saw the first one. Now, the same way you solved the other one, right? You just need, like, Kai's picture one. You just do MD5, right? Put it here. You go ahead to this link, right? And you just download them. And then we we'll download one for example. All right, you can do that real quick. And then you just go back to our friend CyberChef. Toss that out. And you drag it here. Get rid of this. And you calculate that. And there's your first hash. And you plug it in. That's something, that's something I, mean, I, I don't know, like how to even go about it. You have to first download it. Yeah, you have to download it from here, right? You download that file wherever it's located. I have Firefox, so it tells me. But yours is normally be in the downloads folder, so you go to downloads and you do it. And then you get it. And then you drag it into CyberChef. <laughs> But yeah. No. Trying to download it, it doesn't give me the answers. So I have to highlight it and. I mean, I mean for uh, the Google Drive stuff that you have to download. You need to go and select MB5 and then you just drag the file in and it should register this file, right? Do you see this? It looks like this. I, I don't have that. What do you have? I don't have that. Yet. I have all the questions, you know. From question two for Hashin. Okay, so if you want to access CyberChef, you go to the top of the page and you click the link. This, right? You see this all the way at the top of your document that has all the questions? Oh, yeah, I get it. I get it now. Okay. Yeah. And so now you should have it. access to this. And you can search over here and just type things in like, you know, that or like Morse, binary, right? Yeah. 
And then for this problem, it would be MD5. So oh, this one would be MD5. So yep. how, do I, how do I drag the document in? So what you would do is you'd have to download it from the other link on the problem, right? Uh, where is it? This one, this link, click this link, and then you can download it. And then for me, since I have Firefox, it's just right here. And I just simply went ahead and said, drag. And that was it. That helpful? If not, then there's just like, I think it's this, no, nope, no. This one, this icon right here, it says open file as output. You see where my mouse is? Click that and you should just navigate to it, wherever it is on your computer. Oh, for the hash problems, right? Yeah, for, this would be number two. Yeah. So download it? Yep, and you have to download each and every one of those text files. And then you would need to upload them one at a time into CyberChef, grab their hash, this output right here, and then paste it in like so. That's not the right hash. Bang. And then you would compare them against the above hash. And you can be like, ah, oh, this one's been tampered with. So then we're going to go to number two. Let's see, let's, let's download that. And then we're gonna check file number one. We're gonna download that. And then we're gonna go ahead and leave here. And I did file two already, so let's do file two. There's that hash, you put it in, and uh, hey, these two look the same, so file two is not tampered. But let's see what happened with file one as well, just to be thorough. We grab file one, and file one has also been tampered with. And you know, also, if you want to do this by hand, you know, you can go ahead and look and see. Wow. Or how about this one? You know, let, let's compare. Let's compare one and two. Can you spot the difference between these two files, guys? Anybody? Anybody? No? Thought not. That's why the hash is very, very helpful. Because you will be dealing with files that have way more than 38 kilobytes of data, right? And there's no way you're gonna look through and understand all that binary. So the hash is a very, very quick and helpful way to just like, you know, be like, okay, has this file been tampered with? Let's check the hashes. Okay, the hashes don't line up. Something is different in these files. It could be, you know, just a random, you know, it didn't download correctly, or it could be something malicious. But that's why hashing is very, very useful to integrity. Right, so let's do this one. Uh, it's a spicy meatball, right? So you just basically, you go ahead and you go in here and you hash it and you compare it and you realize that's not the right one. So then you do MD4. MD4 is not it. How about this one? How about SHA? SHA3. Is it SHA3? No. My tab just crashed. Great. All right. That's not it. Oh four five. Or actually, instead of doing it that way, I think you can put this in here. All right. You go in here. You do that. Just do that. Uh, I'm gonna clear this. And I think there's an. Oh look! Analyze hash. And it's one of these, SHA-256. Thank you. So I go look for SHA, I think it's SHA-3-256. Pause it. That's not the right word. I go check it out here. It's not that. What about SHA-1? SHA-1 doesn't produce it. Thank you. 
<laughs> Sorry. Ah, Shaw 256. Shaw 2, 256, to be precise. And now the last one. Last one, I'm just going to let you guys struggle with because that's a bonus problem. And, you know, I think you can handle it. Anybody get the bonus yet? Should I download this file or not? Anybody? Anybody have any ideas how to solve the last one? Personally, I think I have to go over again because I've not been getting it. I'm not, I haven't had time using the, the, the chef stuff. Okay. I'm not right. having a hard time using it. Yeah. All right. So um, let's let's go over that in the last minute we have left before I have to send you back, if I can do it quick enough. All right. So um, it's MD5, right? So go to Cyber Chef, look for MD5. Here's MD5. Now, um, you need to download the files, right? Okay, good. And when you download the files, you can click this button right here. You can find your files. Mine are in da downloads, and then you'll see file one, file two, and file three. So I'm gonna select file one, and it's gonna hash it for me. Well, get rid of that. And it's gonna hash it for me. Here's my hash, right? Right there, MD5, hash. So I will copy that. Go to back here, file one, right? That's not the same thing. Why is it different this time? Pause, resume. There it is. I had to redo the hash thing. So that's the same hash I have over here. Okay, cool. Next, after that, you're gonna go ahead and do it again. Take file two as the input, press open, right? Look at file two, pause, run. There it is, there's your hash. Grab the hash, put it in, put it in, compare it. This one is the exact same as this one. Cool, done. It was alpha. Like sometimes it won't hash and you just have to like rerun the hashing script. Like so. You just like press that we'll little. Yet. We're gonna get started in just a second and wrap up. Uh, all right, so we're out of time. Um, good, good working with you all. Um, please head back to the main room. I think we are back, so. Uh, let me just record this last section and here we go. So awesome. Where are we now? Well, we spent a lot of time today going into something that hopefully by the end you were a little lost. That was my goal. Hopefully you got most of it, but hopefully you were like some topics, some of these, these specificities are maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, too much. And, and that's kind of the idea here. It's very hard to understand any topic the first time you kind of entirely go into it. But I wanted you to get a taste for some of the challenges that, uh, um, you know, occur 
for, you know, and maybe it starts to put together a little bit that, that, that little piece, the clicks that, Hey, if somebody can just figure out this key, cause it's that easy. It's literally that easy. If someone got a hold of that key, that's it. All of the encryption that we use when you communicate over the internet, it's over. I can, I can crack it. I can read it. I can see your passwords. I can take those passwords and I can try them on a different website with the same username. Right. Um, you understand a little bit about file integrity. Maybe you don't fully understand hashing and that's okay. Um, but you should have a couple main takeaways from today. So here's what I want. If there's one thing that you remember from today, it's this. Okay. The process of encoding is just simply the representation of data in one format or another. And at the end of the day, for computers, this is just a bunch of ones and zeros. We don't have a choice with the computers. That's all they get. That's all they understand are ones and zeros. And with enough ones and zeros, we can basically represent anything. In some cases, we want to just make data easy to understand. Oh, okay, this combination of ones and zeros equals the letter A, and this combination equals B, and this combination equals C. But in some cases, in the case of security, right, what we are going to become in some cases here, cybersecurity professionals, we want to make sure that that information is not um, able to be modified or read by anyone other than the intended recipient. And in that case, we can use something like encryption, which has been around for a long time. The idea with encryption is hiding data, but with the intention that there will be a way of restoring it back to its original state. Um, this helps maintain what we call confidentiality, right, being able to ensure that um, uh, you know, we can take data from one format, put it into some unreadable format, share that unreadable format, and only the intended target will be able to put that back to its original state. And that's why we use encryption. Additionally, I wanted to touch on hashing. Hashing tends to be a little bit more of a complicated topic, but it's so cool because it's the basis of so many big things in life blockchain. It's the basis of um, uh, password storage. It's also the, the basis of uh, really overall integrity, maintaining the integrity of data. And um, the math behind hashing is actually quite complicated. But the idea behind it is that we take some data and we convert it to a format irreversibly. And now that that data is in that format, only that data could have produced that result. That, re that result is really easy to share. It's really small. Notice that like a file can be gigabytes. A mo you can hash a movie that is gigabytes long and get 32 characters. And we tell you that that 32 characters needs to be unique. That's why we say that you know it's it's very hard to find a good hashing algorithm. It's it's very hard to get you know a, make sure that no two movies will hash to the same value, right? No two combinations of things will result in the same value. What's nice about that is I can send a movie to somebody, tell you what the intended hash was, and when you receive that movie, you can go ahead and check that hash. How many of you have ever noticed that? Um, um, and by the way, does this happen without you even knowing it? Absolutely. How uh, any of you on a Mac or? Yeah, a couple of you are on a Mac, maybe some of you are on a PC. If you're on a Mac, uh, you definitely see it. I think on a PC, we'll tell you this as well, but it'll say, uh, you know, checking, um, uh, like validating a file. When you try to install something, it goes in it, it, before it even installs it, it goes this whole loading bar of just checking to see if this is valid, right? Checking to see if this is valid. What do you think it's doing? It's hashing. It's looking to see if the file that was downloaded is exactly what you intended to download. It seems silly, but your computer does this all of the time to check on you, to make sure that you're safe. PC has its own ways of doing these things as well. Uh, that's a really good question. So a question in the third came up, which is, so Mac is safer than PC? That's a very loaded question. Uh, five to 10 years ago, I would have said yes, straight up. Uh, nowadays, PCs have gotten much, much, much better. The vulnerabilities in, in Macs versus PCs gets into a much more complicated discussion, uh, but you can do plenty of things on your PC to keep yourself safe. Keep your, uh, keep your um, one thing I can recommend if, if you want some security tips coming out of here, it is uh, make sure you're using, uh, make sure you're keeping your computer up to date. I know it's annoying to go through that like uh, operating system updating process like all of the time, but those are there because there are security vulnerabilities, right? How many times do you do one of those and there's like a change in like how it looks? Very rarely, right? Most of the time there's somebody, some, one of, one of us, one of these hackers out there, not the, 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 not the white hats, the black hats, the ones, the ones who are, you know, actually trying to infiltrate those they might have found something that that is that they're able to do to exploit you to malicious to, to maliciously take over and if you look at most of these data breaches that occur well guess what it's because these companies didn't patch it's because they didn't keep their operating systems up to date at the very least you should do that and i also recommend using a um uh um a 
uh, password manager also so that you can generate uniquely complicated passwords for each site. Therefore, if a password does get dumped from any particular site, uh, it, it can't be used on other sites, right? You only, you're using a password manager and that password manager makes the passwords for you on any given site. Again, we're getting into some of the details here, but I want to make sure that you've learned something today. You shouldn't have learned it all. It's too much to learn it all. Cybersecurity is big. It's really cool, but it's really big. And it's a history goes back way before computers. Cryptography is just one of those topics. Um, and, uh, you know, here at the bootcamp, we cover so, so, so much more of this. This is just a sliver, right? We haven't talked about any of the tools, any of the ways of doing these things. We've showed you one. We've showed you CyberChef. And CyberChef is the Swiss Army knife. You can do a lot of things. Okay, uh, Ryan asked a good question here. Would it, be po would it be a good idea to keep a hash value for all of our personally archived files to make sure they have not been tampered with uh, while unused? Um, so that's a good question. I mean, it might, it, it, would it be a good idea to make sure they're not tampered with? Yes. I think that it, it's not a bad idea to do something like that. The problem is, is like checking that in kind of an automated fashion is quite difficult, but it is something that antiviruses provide by default. So if you have an antivirus on your machine, um, it should take care of a lot of these things, making sure that files are not being tampered with, um, and making sure that your machine hasn't been infiltrated to, to, to get hacked would mean that you're beyond this, right? Beyond hashing. I could just take over that hashing file and, and change it myself. If you got hacked, you're, you're, you're kind of past the point where, where hashes. We're basically trying to prevent the fact of, of getting hacked, right? Preventing ourselves from downloading something malicious. That's the idea here, right? To make sure that the integrity of the file from the source is the same at the destination. Does that make sense? That's, what, that's, what, that's why we would do something like that. Really good questions. I'm so excited that all of you are asking these kinds of questions after just three hours with me. Um, I've had a great time with you all. And at this point, I want to just open it up for, uh, unless Rachel, you have something else to add here. I want to just open it up for Q and A. Yeah, I'm just going to add that I'm going to uh, throw a feedback form into the group Zoom chat. It would be really awesome. It's seven questions and very easy to fill out. It'd be really great to get some feedback from you all so we can make this workshop better. Please, thank you so much. We really, and, and, and that's one thing about being a boot camp. Um, I used to teach at, uh, I've taught at Binghamton University, I've taught at Lehigh University. And when I taught there, I'll tell you that there was a lot more uh, college bureaucracy around having to change content, having to change curriculum, right? If you look at computer science programs at, at a lot of these universities, they're teaching languages that haven't been used in like many institutions in decades. Um, and and that's, a, that's an unfortunate truth. Uh, they're getting better, of course. Um, but we want to be able to make sure that we always tune things so that they're right. We'd like to be on our feet and make changes so that we adapt to technology. Our curriculum adapts to always the newest technology and the demand of our hiring partners. The, the, what they tell us that they need, what, what roles are out there and that you need to fill, that's what we focus on. And that's how we tune things, right? Uh, so it's very important to, to uh, keep an eye on that. Can you tell us a, a little bit more about the different roles uh, in cybersecurity department of a company? Really good question. Um, so there are a lot of different cybersecurity facing jobs. And this is one of the things about cyber that's important to note is that it's a very breadth heavy field, um, meaning that there is so much, you know, uh, different things that you kind of need to know to build the foundation of being a cybersecurity professional. I can talk to you about a few different cybersecurity roles, right? There's everything up to the top, the executive suite, that's the CISO, right? The uh, cyber information security officer, the chief cyber, so cyber, chief information security officer or CISO at a company is usually the chief executive off, is the chief executive or the C-suite executive for cybersecurity. Uh, and that goes all the way down through the, the SOC analyst, which is our very common entry role. The SOC analysts are there for like basically... Um, Think of like security guards of the cyber world, right? Their job is to basically keep, um, uh, um, you know, uh, keep an eye on like if anything is happening in their system and react to those changes. So one thing that we didn't talk about here is like what happens if, you know, you know, we, the last example, you may have seen it already. If you didn't do the problem, we ask you to like make a decision about whether a file should be allowed to be kept by an employee or not. Right? A lot of those decisions happen in real time for you and you have to make those decisions quite quickly. So you need to have a, a you know, an arsenal of tools to be able to solve different problems uh, in the job. So th there's some jobs like that on the defensive side. There's also, um, cybersecurity engineers, that's another role. If your interest is really in, in programming and, and development as well, um, there's a lot of uh, capabilities to 
look and review code that web developers write, the websites that you use every day, and basically test them for security vulnerabilities. See if there's any flaws with any of the packages that they use or anything that they actually use. That's that's another really critical role. Um, there's, um, oh God, I could keep going here, but there's DevOps, which is a little bit beyond what we cover in this class, which is actually dealing with like infrastructure and making sure that uh, systems are up to date, that architecture is working well in the cloud. How many of you have heard of the cloud before, right? AWS. Um, many, many uh, companies, you know, have resorted to putting their stuff in the cloud and they have a DevOps engineer who's, you know, kind of uh, working at the company who's leading the security there. And then there's also the other side, which is the offensive side, offensive security. Um, which is uh, red teaming, right? Uh, which is basically a penetration test, meaning you go into different companies as a, either as a consultant or you work there like long term, and you basically try to hack their systems legally. They give you ethical permission to go and try to hack systems, and you have to go and look for vulnerabilities and actually try to compromise their systems to take over their machines. And it's it's pretty cool. If you want to hear more about like stories of people in the industry and hackers, there's a really good podcast called Darknet Diaries uh, that I would highly, highly, highly recommend. Um, that's Darknet Diaries. Uh, very, very, very good on all podcast platforms. I will also recommend okay. our Hacking 101 course, which does sort of interview profiles with people who work in the industry. It's a really great um, opportunity to like hear from people who are doing different things within the industry. Good. Okay, the next question was, do you think there's a, it's a good idea if one app stores all the passwords? Do I think that's a good idea? Um, that's a really good point. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, you, good apps, oh, this is such a complicated question. Do I think it's a good idea? The, the answer is, is putting all your eggs in one basket is usually a bad idea. However, a good password security application should be managed by your highest security password. Meaning that that application, that one password app or or whatever else there is out there. I know there's a bunch of them. Even Google Chrome lets you do this. You need to make sure that your email password and your one password password or whatever you choose to use is literally the strongest password. I usually recommend three to four to five English words. Don't try this whole, oh, let me replace an A with a at symbol. I'll crack your password. It's not gonna stop me, I promise you. Um, um, what will stop me is if you make your password quite complex by adding a lot of like, variation by adding lots of words. So if you do like three, four, five, six words, like, you know, you choose like, uh, I don't know, you know, like phone, you know, uh, wait, this is not my I'm password. Just, that's a password. You know, remote. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Like exactly like words, like actual words is, is, is can create a lot more complexity. Now in terms of having your own, um, as long as the password manager is being used on that local device, I know that's complicated, then there's really no risk there and they should not even be able to see your password if it's a really good password manager. Um, but that gets into a more complicated discussion. The, the short answer is it's better than using the same password across multiple sites. That's the, that's the short answer there. Is it great? No, but it's better than using the same password across multiple sites and we're all lazy. Um, okay, uh, what else do we have here? So anyone else have, uh, is there any class on RMF? Uh, and have you been able to place Canadian cyber sex students in opportunities in the US? Uh, these are, some of these questions are, are definitely beyond the scope of this right now. Uh, Isaac, can you clarify your question a little bit? Are you talking about risk management? Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Um, um, oh, yeah. Can I stop the screen share? Yes. Am I screen sharing? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So, yeah, you're talking about risk management. Okay. So, yeah, we absolutely, especially during the foundations of our course, we go into risk management. We talk about how, like, what do operations actually look like for a cybersecurity team? Like, what, what, are, what, are, what does that actually look like, right? Uh, we talk about um, some of the fundamentals of um, using these systems. We go into a whole wide variety of tools. Um, and uh, that, that's kind of the, the, the main things that we'll cover in terms of RMF. Veer is our, is our lead uh, blue team instructor, actually. Um, and that is definitely something that you'll hear more about when we cover our blue team curriculum as well. Um, Indeed, okay. we do talk about risk in different ways. Yep. So, so that's definitely something that, that we'll talk about. Um, um, what were the other questions? I lost the I chat can, here. Uh, take the question about the Canadian citizens. Yes, please. So Laura asks, have you been able to place ca Canadian cybersex students in opportunities in the U.S.? So right now our programs are uh, based in New York City. Um, and so anyone who's going through the program would need to be in New York City, at least for, um, you know, once we come out of this uh, um, COVID moment. Um, and, and so any, and that would be one requirement. The second requirement is that someone 
is able to work in the United States. Uh, we don't do sort of like visa sponsorship or anything like that. But in terms of being able to support students that are from other countries that come to the, to the States for um, education purposes, they, uh, and then are looking for a job, we sort of would work with you in the same way that we work with any other student um, to sort of support that career success search. So we're uh, very new, so I'm not sure that we have any uh, uh, Canadian citizens at this moment that have been placed, um, but it is something that Full Stack as a company has done in the past. I hope that answers that question. Nick saw me sneeze. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> Um, is the boot camp as fast paced as today's workshop? Good question. Um, so let me say this. Uh, it doesn't start this fast paced. Uh, we ramp up. It is a boot camp. Okay. And we, we, we do, we do mean that, um, there is the part-time program, which is a little bit slower paced. It's a little bit like you have a longer period of time, uh, a little bit more time for self-study and reflection. Um, believe it or not, you adjust to the pace quite quickly. Um, I mean, I see our, our teaching assistants here nodding along. They were former students and they could, they could speak to this probably pretty well. Um, but, you know, a lot of times we, we do what's called um, um, scattered repetition. So like, for example, you heard about encryption and hashing today and probably got like five to 10% of what I said, but maybe you have this like idea now of like, all right, I kind of get how this works or that works, but I don't really get the whole thing. They definitely talked about too many things this quick. And then next week you're going to hear it again and then again, and then again, and then again, in slightly different formats, in slightly different scenarios, right? Um, it will ask you to crack passwords at some point. If you come here, you'll have to hack into machines by cracking passwords. That'll be a task that you have to do. Are you ready to do that? Absolutely not, right? But, but, but by the time you hear this three or four times, eventually, maybe, just then you'll suck at it a little less. And that's the idea, right? And I know I'm blunt when I say that, but it, it is... Um, we do try to keep it fun. There's a lot of activities. There's a lot of puzzles. There's a lot of solving. And there's a lot of hacking uh, and ethical hacking, right? We only work in, in legal environments where we actually are licensed to work. Um, uh, and so, so it is a lot of fun. Is it fast-paced? The full-time program is quite fast-paced. I will say that. Um, it is not. Um, it, the part-time program is a little bit at a different pace, but the part-time program also only focuses mostly. You will get penetration testing practice in the part-time program, but you'll be mostly doing um, a SOC analyst training. You'll be working on the blue team side of things more than you will on the red team side of things, where there's like a one-to-one, -one basically equal level in, um, in the full-time program. Um, so hopefully that helps answer that question. We do ramp up. Like we don't like go to full speed really quickly. Yeah. Um, next question. Are there any provisions for international students visa processing? I think that's a Rachel question. Yeah. So similar to my uh, response to Laura's, uh, we don't offer any sort of visa processing or anything in that way. Uh, if you come as a student, then you'll have to find a, a sponsorship for that in a different way. Um, so I hope that's helpful uh, in that question. It's, uh, you know, something that we've looked at but are not able to do at this point in time. Uh, awesome. Uh, any future interest in providing online learning resources for those in different states? Uh, uh, Rachel, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so I don't know how many of you are located outside of the New York City area, um, but we are looking at uh, expanding our programming to other um, organizations. Um, so we have been looking to partner with some universities uh, and they may be more local to what you're looking for. So what I would encourage you to do is email us cyber-info at fullstackacademy.com. I'll drop it in the, in the Slack sorry, in the chat, um, and they should be able to help you connect with a program that might be more local to you. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, resources, uh, stay tuned. Uh, AI, uh, is AI playing a role in the InfoSec realm? Uh, yeah. Uh, are students exposed to it? Mm. AI is such a broad term, everybody. I want to just say this. AI is artificial intelligence. Um, a computer that um, 
knows how to, you know, uh, play tic-tac-toe against you because it checks what the next best, you know, by, by calculating the board is, is AI technically. Um, but then there gets into complicated AI, like machine learning. Yes, the short answer is yes. Machine learning is, um, uh, has, has massive implications in cybersecurity, massive. I mean, like, especially like detecting, uh, usually like a lot of detection systems can use an AI component and have AI components to them. Um, I know with like uh, content distribution networks, things like um, Netflix and, uh, you know, that, that rely on massive amounts of data, they want to make sure that people aren't like wasting their data. Because every time you log on to Netflix and you're watching a movie, they have to pay for that like uptime, right? Um, so so uh, sometimes you'll hear of attacks. How many of you have heard of a term called DDoS attacks? DDoS denial of service attacks. So this is distributed denial of service, meaning basically uh, hackers will go and take a bunch of computers and launch them at a website to make sure that that website is unusable by others. That's effectively the idea behind a distributed denial of service attack. A little glossing there. Um, so, but, but, but that's mainly the idea. Um, there's a lot of analysis that can be done though to detect or filter. Basically when somebody comes to a website, is that person a real person or are they a robot? And a lot of that, for example, can be driven by a lot of good algorithms and a lot of good machine learning and a lot of good intelligence. So is it something that we will directly cover? No. But will you understand or be able to think about applications so that you'll be able to adapt to the workforce? Yes. And we're not going to teach you machine learning or artificial intelligence here directly. We actually did have a... Um, a teaching assistant in the last cohort that was diving and taking a machine learning class in Python to supplement uh, this so that she could actually do some some work with this. You know, given a, a file of people who tried to log into this computer, can you make a prediction about what what um, you know what each person's doing or what they're trying to do or what's malicious or what's not malicious, right? So we, we you definitely have the opportunity to dive into those things, but we won't explicitly cover machine learning because it's so wide, right? Like that we just talked about DDoS attacks against like Netflix. That's like one topic right it's so this field is so large that it would be very hard to cover that but i would love to um let's see um i skipped a question okay i'm uh, sorry about that gail um is laguardia cyber bridge program linked to the full stack program uh rachel this one's for you yeah so gail i just responded to you in chat um but basically yes we are um linked with them so we are partnered with LaGuardia to run the cyber bridge program as part of the cyber nyc initiative um, we don't do any of the enrollment for those programs so all of the uh, sort of marketing and enrollment processes admissions applications all of that goes through LaGuardia um, and you'll start your training with LaGuardia and then you transition to training with us so any questions that you have about their programming uh, or about the cyber bridge program it's best to reach out to them directly um, as we sort of don't manage any of that part of the process uh rachel there's another question on scholarship opportunities for the next class um okay yeah uh let's see we have a um we have our standing scholarship uh opportunities so any female identifying individual is uh uh is the we have a sorry we have a scholarship called ada lovelace which is made available to every any every and any female identifying individual um, of $1,000, so that's available. We also have a $1,000 veteran scholarship, so anyone who has served would be uh, eligible for our veteran scholarship. Um, and then we're also running a, um, a founder's cohort scholarship, so for the first couple of our part-time programs, we're taking off $2,000 of the tuition. So um, those opportunities are available to be seen on our website. You can go to the tuitions and dates page and you'll be able to see all of those options. Okay, um, good. So the next question here is, uh, I think, wait, maybe I skipped another one. How much time do students spend typically studying outside of class? Um, so. This is a, uh, uh, let, me, let me talk again. again. So there's the part-time the, the, the part program and the full-time program. The, the, the part-time program is 26 weeks part-time with a focus primarily and entirely really on blue team, on becoming a defensive you know, uh, analyst. With that program, uh, there's a little bit of flavor of red team in there, but it's not the full red team experience. Um, it's still a, a fantastic program. That program is made for people who are like, um, uh, like either a have a full-time job and, and like don't want to do the transition as quickly and want to either a keep their full-time role and, and learn some new experiences or b you know transition while in their full-time role um 
that program ramps a lot slower and the outside of work, like outside of class requirements range from two to five hours a week. Okay. And then you have three class sessions a week. So it's like, um, uh, you have Tuesday nights, which is three hours, Thursday night, which is three hours and Saturday, which is, um, um, uh, four right, hours, yeah. four hours. Yeah. 9 a.m. to 1, 1 p.m. Um, and that's that's four hours. So that's that's that. And that is, uh, I don't know, I think that might be entirely remote next time. I'm not sure on that. Uh, but but it might be. So keep an eye out for that. If you aren't from New York, that could be a good opportunity. Um, uh, additionally, uh, what else we got? So the, 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 with the full-time program, look, the, I'm not going to lie to you. The full-time program is an immersive experience and it's going to be very um, intensive. What we do is we tend to give you pre-work that makes sure that you like kind of get this first like slap in the face of material. Like, oh, I maybe got time. You ever like study for an exam and then like you study and you're like, I'm going to fail this exam. And then the next day you magically, after you cram, like know it, like it just kind of like you can recall it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe a lot of you feel like this right now. Like there's no way you can remember any of this. But so, half of you are going to be talking to your friends or family later. And you're going to be like, you know what I learned today about encryption? And they're going to be like, please be quiet. We didn't go to this event. You did. So stop, shut up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but but, but um, the, the, that's what we try to do to you. So with the full-time program, the amount of work that you have varies by week and where you are in the program. It can be anywhere from an hour or two as much as some students put in as much as six, eight, 10 hours a week outside of class. Um, again, that's the idea though. It's a full-time immersive environment that converts you from whatever your profession is right now from just scratch. Literally, we're gonna start from scratch, like even before what we talked about today. Like what I talked about today is not the first lecture, right? What we talked about today is like lecture 17. So why the hell did I talk about it today? Well, we tried to take a different approach so that you get a little flavor for the things that we talk about. And it's a really cool topic, right? Um, I think maybe all of you are like, why did you pick cryptography? I don't know. Uh, 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 but I think it's fun to talk about. So we will ramp you up. There is a lot of work outside of class uh, and it, it really depends on a week by week basis. So I would say an average of four to five hours a week outside of class. Uh, next question. Is there a payment plan? Rachel, that one's back to you. Yeah, thanks for this question. So we do partner with an organization called Skills Fund. Um, this is an organ, it's a, a lending partner. Um, they work with a lot of coding boot camps and we've seen that, um, you know, they have a little bit more flexibility in terms of the terms that they can offer. They just sort of have a better understanding of what this industry looks like, what jobs look like, what salaries look like um, than some traditional, more traditional financing partners. So uh, Skills, uh, skillsfund.com, skills.fund. I will find the website and I can put it in the chat and you'll be able to see there. They even have a calculator for you to be able to choose which program you're looking for and how much you'd want to finance, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I actually skipped like three questions when I referred to you there. So let's go back. Uh, where is it? If you want to get it. Okay, no, no. Well, okay, no, there's a couple. So this one's actually for you. Aisha asked, is LaGuardia the only partner, Rachel? At this time, yes. Um, LaGuardia is the only partner. Awesome. Um, what will be the difference in the bootcamp experience if COVID-19 is stopping uh, the June programs from meeting in person? Okay, good question. So uh, we have done... Um, uh, let me ask you, like, like, do you feel like we were engaged? Do you feel like, right, I, I'm going to be the same person teaching that boot camp. Um, I, I think that this is a great opportunity personally to, if you have the time, the ability, or, or maybe you're in a situation where, where you're really considering this, I, I happen to think that this is a very good time to do it. I, we have done everything in our power to make this experience as fun, as interactive, as involved as it is. Um, and, and, and we try to stay engaging in lectures. We try to stay engaging in videos. We try to stay engaging in whatever we're actually doing. And the workshops are engaging on their own. Everything that we do can be done in the cloud and everything that we do, the entire course, like right now we are running a course entirely remotely. And I think it's going great. Like I think that um, in, in some ways it's even better, right? You have this no, there's no rush to catch the train. There's, there's a lot of advantages to it where we have this more complete day uh, kind of feel to it. Um, and and that, that, that's really nice. Are there any disadvantages? I would say there's a couple. Like there are, there, there, there is sometimes a feeling of like, um, like, you know, I wish the instructor was right here. 
but really I am. I'm like, I'm right here. Hey, everyone. Like, right. I'm not that far away. So, so, so it isn't, uh, I think we're doing our best to make it feel like a good experience and you certainly don't lose out. In fact, all of the tools that we use are meant to originally be used remotely. And now we're not sharing the same bandwidth of a local router, which is fine. Um, but, but, um, you know, there's definitely some advantages to doing this remotely on the other side of things. It's a real cyber feel, isn't it? Uh, so so um, I, I, I think that we're doing our best to make it, and I don't think there's going to be a big bootcamp experience change there. Um, if we want to get a jumpstart on foundation, should we watch all the Professor Messer videos mentioned in the cybersecurity workbook? Uh, any other things that we can do to get a jumpstart on foundations? I have one thing to say here, and then I'm going to actually hand this question to uh, Emily, uh, Rachel. Oh, my God. Um, uh, usually, Emily's in the classroom, not Rachel. So you guys don't know who Emily is. So I'm going to stop talking about her. Uh, anyway, so 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 uh, if you want to get Jumpstart on Foundations, yes, Professor Messer's videos are really good. Uh, Professor Messer basically goes into a lot of concepts that describe uh, three introductory certs in cyber. The first of which is more of a net kind of like or an IT cert, which is the A plus certification. I would skip most of that. I would say if you can start with the net plus materials from Professor Messer or the sec plus material, really the net plus, the net plus materials from Professor Messer. Those are really important. Um, so there's the net plus certification and the sec plus certification. Uh, those are really good. Um, uh, and also that also goes into uh, Aisha's question on Cybrary. Cybrary is a really good tool. Um, I think that I have a couple of feelings about Cybrary. Cybrary is like you demi for cyber in a lot of ways. Like it's it's very um, modular in terms of the courses that you take. If you were trying to just get sec plus or like just get this certification, I think that that's a really good route to go. Um, I think that where I have trouble with cyber is like getting prepared for the job in cybersecurity, the actual application, the actual testing of the skill, not just the regurgitation of stuff. You notice today, like we actually had you crack a password. Yeah, Kaya 3 was not that hard to guess, right? But, but eventually if we scale that up, if you're able to write a piece of software that could guess all of Corey's dog's names and all of his favorite things, you're going to have a better chance at actually cracking my password, right? So, um, you know, once you start going from like idea to application, that's where I think that um, a lot of these online things that aren't very interactive or don't have a lot of like workshop focused things uh, kind of fall off. But overall, I've heard very good things about Cyberry. Uh, did you want to add anything, uh, Rachel, to... Um, uh, the is there anything else that they can do to be prepared? Sure, yeah. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that we are going to be jumping into some of the technical skills and foundations, and sometimes people like to start on those earlier. So um, specifically, we learn a little bit of the command line, Linux command line, and Python during foundations. So there are some really great free resources out there. Uh, the Code Academy command line uh, tutorial is pretty good, as is their Python 3 tutorial. So those are, you know, easy. I think they're like 10 hours each uh, tutorials for you to be able to work through uh, while you're waiting to get into foundations. Uh, is it Lori or Lor Loris? Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But um, to answer your question, how many students are in a cohort maximum? Um, it depends. So there's two things we keep an eye on. There's the instructor to student ratio and the teaching assistant to student ratio. And those are the things that are not flexible. Uh, I think for instructors, it's something like 18 or 18 to one max or 16 to one max. It's one of those, it's one, it's somewhere in that range. And then for teaching assistants, it's anywhere between seven and nine to one max. I think right now we're actually at uh, six to one, really. We're about six to one with teaching assistants to students. And we're about uh, 11 to one with instructors. Uh, so, so, uh, but it won't ever go exceed those numbers that I just told you. Um, and in fact, in this case, we have enough students where we're running two concurrent cohorts. Um, so, so it, it really depends on the, the cohort. There isn't, uh, what we care more about is the split of, um, uh, you know, it, it direct, like having someone who's a direct mentor to you that will never exceed uh, six or seven to one really. And what I would add to that is that the average cohort size that we're seeing is somewhere between 28 to 40. Um, you know, as Corey said, I don't want to like give you any hard numbers because we are more focused on those ratios, but that's basically what we've seen in the last year or so. Um, Emily is encrypted code for Rachel. Very funny. Uh, so, 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 uh, um, okay. What else here? What else? Um, any other questions from you all? 
All right. I, I, uh, okay. I'll wait another second. Anything else? Did I miss any questions? All right. I, I hope you all had a good time today. Uh, please take the survey that's coming out in the, in the chat and we'll send it out by email too, but please, 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 uh, send, you know, please give some feedback on this. We want to make this better. I hope you learned something today. I hope you got excited a little bit about cybersecurity. It's a really, I'm telling you, it is an awesome time to enter this industry. And I have, it, it reminds me of, I don't know, like web development 15 years ago, when you wanted someone to make a website for you, you like knew a kid down the block who was like 13 and knew how to make websites. And that's who like built your website. Like nobody knew how to do it. Like you just needed to like, like find somebody. That's how in demand this field is right now. It's disgusting. Like there is not enough people for what we need. The amount of attacks that we get per day is very, very, very scary. Um, and all these data breaches just show time and time again that this is becoming more and more and more important. So, you know, I think it's a good time to think about cybersecurity. And if you enjoyed it, I encourage you to continue working with us and, and, and checking out some of our other programs that we offer as well. All right. So we will be in touch and we will be following up through that pipeline. All right. Um, so get out there and get going. All right. Have a great, have a, uh, did you send out the link, Rachel? I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Please, please, please send out that link when you get a chance and we'll send it out by email too. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Bye. Another, some Bye. Other questions, please let us know by email and we'll follow up with those.